spice things up. Yeah. Hmm. Hey, yo, is this is this actually working? Yeah, well, happy new year. It's a 2022 year. Back on the mic, I hope this is coming through clear. Like Crystal Pepsi, 7-Up, Sprite. I'm just freestyling and revving up. Right, yeah. It's Weekend at Bergie's episode 38. Just watch Boba Fett. Yo, it was pretty great. Hey, did anybody catch that who jib? People like, yo, word bird. I know that you did. Yeah, it's true, kid. You know I didn't miss it. I'm very excited. Um, hey, just had Christmas. This beat is um straight off continuum. That new back burner album coming to your living room in February. But this is still Jan. Favorite part in Beat Street when that dude eats the can. Man, go check that other podcast. Me and Buck 65 just had a lot of laughs. Yeah. Just like today, wait and see with my special guest, Diagnostic AT. Hey, you see, you might you might be able to see me right now because uh, this is the first time we have done a weekend at Bergie's on video. So, <laughs> still figuring things out. Big shout out to Jesse Dangerously and Diagnostic AT for helping me try and finally join the rest of the world and. Uh, and get on uh, a video podcast. Um, this is also coming to you audio uh, in audio format for all of you who tune in normally. Thanks for tuning in. Yes, we're interrupting the Inside Cobra Island special series that we've been doing because I, j- I just want to have a few more interviews. We, uh, we've got a lot of cool people I, I want to talk to, um, including today's guest, Diagnostic 80, podcaster, Beat producer, action figure collector, and uh, and a lot more. And today we're going to learn a lot more about Diagnostic 80, whom you may or may not know from the Full Force podcast, from uh, perhaps Space First, which is an album he produced some amazing tracks on, Toronton, Spectral Mike, um, of course, um, and uh, Cybertronicer. And uh, we've been friends for a while, worked on a lot of tracks. We're going to get into all of that. And I, I think you'll be, uh, you'll be interested to learn a lot about Diagnostic 80, because I was. Shout out to Brian Sauer, who helped with the uh, special effects you are going to see on this little podcast, the little screen thing. And uh, again, like this is the first time we've done a video thing, so I apologize if you're only listening to the audio and wondering, what are you, what are you talking to? I'm trying not to, to show and tell too much, but for those of you watching... Yeah, I'm still rocking my Cobra Christmas sweater because it's awesome and it's cold out. And uh, look, it's still I'm still in that first first week post holidays, just getting used to it. Um, so I, I I didn't get to go to any holiday parties this year because uh, we're we're locked down again. I hope I hope you're doing well wherever you're at and and making the best of things and staying safe and healthy. But uh, I'm locked down and uh, look, we got. We got a lot going on here in the Wurberg lair. A lot of new music. Backburner Continuum drops in February, which is like very soon. That's like a few weeks away. So check that out on Han Solo Records. Of course, it's the third Backburner group album. That's my uh, the group that I'm a part of. A lot of dope MCs and producers that you're probably familiar with uh, if you've listened to any of my records before. Um, really excited about this one. It's like 15 tracks, I think, is what the final cutoff is. And uh, I'm on a whole bunch of those, as well as a bunch of the Backburner crew. So check that out on Hand Solo Records. Um, yeah, the Rap Viper Tooks, we've got some left. If you need some to stay warm, uh, just shoot me a message or uh, just check our Bandcamp page, wordburglar.bandcamp.com or propsdepartment.bandcamp.com. And um, what else was I going to tell you about? The MacGuffin device vinyl, we're so close. There have been so many hiccups uh, leading up to getting this out to you and uh, getting it out to us. So we're going to be doing this crowdfunder for the MacGuffin device vinyl. And uh, I'm really excited. It's going to feature a whole bunch of songs from the Rhyme Your Business album with all new artwork by Brian Sauer. And we will be revealing that very soon. So please stay tuned to wordburglar.com. And, uh, and I can't wait to uh, 
to hopefully bring this project to vinyl and talk a lot more about that. Um, just going through my notes, is there anything else to get into? We've got This is a giant episode. It's a really in-depth, long chat with Diagnostic 80, and uh, I just had an amazing time talking with him, and I want to really thank him for really being so generous with his time on this podcast. And uh, for those who don't know also, uh, my other podcast, Do You Still Like This Movie? We just dropped a new episode featuring Buck 65, and we talk about Beat Street. So go find that, however you listen to podcasts. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I just want to dive into this interview with Diagnostic 80. Let us know how this works. It's the first video weekend at Bergies, and hopefully we'll be coming at you with a lot more video content and audio content um, super soon. So let's just dive in and uh, and get to know our friend, Diagnostic 80. With me today, we've got the host of The Full Forest, a podcast professional, a musical producer extraordinaire, a um, <laughs> pop culture maven, uh, someone I'm honored to call a friend, a Aww. collaborator, and uh, and here with right now on the weekend. Everyone, get excited! We're here with Diagnostic Eighty. So, McLeod, hey, hey, buddy, Thank you, man, this is so great. Thanks for uh, coming over virtually. Thank you for having me. Weekend at Burgess. yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you for having me. What a weekend! I'm very excited. It's been a good weekend. Good weekend for you so far. It's been pretty good. Yeah, it's been an amazing week. Uh, lots of crazy stuff has happened, and yeah, it's, it's so far, so far, so good. Get to talk to you. That intro was a bit too. Uh, that was a bit too nice, mate. That was a bit too. <laughs> <laughs> bit too uh yeah that's pumped me up now i won't be able to get my head through the door <laughs> well you know i was i'm trying to hype you up for the people and you know just give them a you know <laughs> yeah trying to like build me up a little bit yeah <laughs> i uh no because i was wondering i was i was thinking i was like how how did i first become aware of diagnostic 80 was it through the full force podcast was it just through the internet was it through like the gi joe community and i'm i'm pretty sure it was from the from podcasting and your podcasting uh chops and i i was a fan and listener and oh. and we had we had connected online and i think i hassled friends. you a lot i think i stalked and hassled you a lot <laughs> we'll get to the, we'll get to the story about why i hassled you a lot but yeah that that will come later in the the timeline of my <laughs> of my life in music i guess well it was welcomed hassling <laughs> 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 I can't always say that. No. But, uh, and, and it was it never felt like a hassle. It was more like, oh great, here's this cool person who likes cool things and we are into the same stuff. And uh yeah, we let's let's talk, let's connect. And and sure enough, as soon as we started talking more and connecting more, you know, we just I think we found that wow, we're very similar, despite being from, you know, different sides of the uh Commonwealth pond. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how I, you're going to describe that <laughs> uh well yeah so you did grow up in in the uk uh whereabouts exactly were, were the well, early days well if we're going really early days i was actually born in germany so as a as a little child born into the world uh to to, to wonderful parents my uh my mother sue and my father david um I'm very like I, you know I, I think a lot of you know I think a lot of people say this anyway but a lot of their musical tastes in general kind of flow through the parents and and how you kind of experience music is usually through what they're listening to when you're a kid and uh it was a kind of the similar thing but I mean I yeah so my dad was in the Royal Air Force so he was stationed out in Germany at the time and they had me out there uh, my poor mother was in a military hospital in Rinteln, West Germany, and at the time, and it was apparently like horrible conditions. There were rats running all over the place. It was like a proper, it was like a Saw movie I was oh, born man. into, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh no, uh, I know, I know. So, um, yeah. So that was kind of my that was my introduction to the world. I was there for about eighteen months, and then. I was I was moved quickly to the United Kingdom, where I grew up in lots of little. Well, there was Coltishall was where we moved first. Again, no one's ever going to hear of these places that listen to the show. They're going to be like, "What's he talking about?" But yeah, Coltishall was the first place um, that we moved to, and I was only little, and that was on a RAF base. 
And then we moved to a place called Munsley. And that was like a little coastal town in Norfolk, uh, right on the coast. And yeah, like, so basically our house was on a cliff and it would overlook, you know, the channel. And it was just, it was amazing. And so yeah, I grew up on, wow. I grew up right next to a beach. So it would just be like, you know, um, kind of took it a little bit for granted. But, you know, as a kid, well into kind of like G.I. Joe and all that kind of stuff, or Action Force as it was back then. And we would just play army, we play action force, dress up in all our, you know, gear and everything. And yeah, so my my childhood was a fun one. It was a is an enjoyable, fun one. And it was one that was uh yeah, very, very much like early on was kind of steeped in music. Like it was like, you know, it, it was like a it was a love of mine from a very early age, basically. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's you know, I was thinking about this as well because you know, we're both sort of, you know of the same era and i think like you know kids who grew up in like the 80s and 90s like the the music and the action figures specifically maybe gi joe and action force there does seem to be a lot of crossover and i've, I've met within our community and, and that's something we can touch on yeah. i know for the for our listeners right now who we've talked about action force before and for those who may not know how could you describe action force to someone effectively who, who may not be familiar if I take all the heart out of it, it's just the rebranding of G.I. Joe in the United Kingdom and some places in, and some aspects in Europe as well. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we got we, Action Force was um, kind of started as a Palatoy thing, different company that had a relationship with Hasbro. And they both developed toy lines roughly like in the same year what G.I. Joe was developed in the U.S., and Action Force was developed to be like a smaller version of Action Man, which was, of course, also had its symbiosis with G.I. Joe 12-inch figures as well. So you had this like ongoing, I, I guess, like relationship between these two companies. Um, Palatoy produced these Action Force figures completely separately, not knowing what G.I. Joe were doing until the toy fair came along and they saw each other and they're like, they, like they do the spider-man thing where they're pointing at each other the meme you know like they're all like what are you doing what, what are you doing and um eventually hasbro like long story short hasbro kind of took over the situation like they were using palatoys like a distributor and then you know eventually like put their figures into the action force line and then eventually it was all action force and then before like Hall palatoy went bankrupt and then uh, hasbro took over in the uk and it was it was Action Force, G.I. Joe, the Action Force, and then finally G.I. Joe. Wow. I actually didn't know that Palatoy was making Action Force on their own. I knew they, there was a series. Yeah. yeah well, both I, I, they both developed it for that toy year, that toy fair year. Yeah. And they were both at toy fair showing off these. <laughs> they're going, uh, what are you, what's the, you didn't tell us about this. <laughs> wow. And they're like, well, we, we kind of like that your guys can bend their knees. And because, uh, yeah. yeah, the... Uh, yeah. The original Action Force line, they're more that original Star Wars five, five points point. artic yeah, yeah, exactly. articulation. The, you told yeah. me specifically this wasn't going to be a, a podcast about toys, and we're already about <laughs> 10 minutes deep in uh, in action figures. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, that's, you know, and that's, we don't need to go there because we want to know more about you, you know, for those of us who listen to your podcast, and, and if you're listening now and you have any interest in action figures and pop culture and specifically G.I. Joe and Action Force, uh, you need to check out The Full Force with Christopher, which I've shouted out, I think, many times in many different places. And it's just amazing. And I amazing. always message you. I always message you to go, <laughs> Dude, thanks for the shout out. That's amazing. Well, I'm just, it's so great to see what you've done with it. And really, if you need your, your Full Force Action Force fix, people can tune into that. Um, so, me, so we won't dwell on it. But yeah, sorry. Go well, on. Be, uh, so not to dwell on it, but I'm going to fast forward a little bit and we'll talk quickly about me and you right and one of the reasons like I obviously I knew I knew of you through Welcome to Cobra Island but I actually I was list I'd heard songs that you'd done prior to that and I don't know I can't remember the ins and outs of it but like I was aware of you as an artist right and um I can't I'm not sure if it was maybe kind of the lead up to you bringing Welcome to Cobra Island out so it was like you know, you'd mentioned maybe that it was coming and some people had shared it and, you know, it, it was on my radar effectively. So when what Welcome to Cobra Island dropped, now a couple of, I would say like about six months prior to you dropping that album, I was developing an album of music related to Action Force and G.I. Joe in a m very similar vein, because 
you, 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 they may not know that I'm also a rapper as well as a producer. Yes, well, that's and what we got to get into. We, we yeah. will get into that eventually. But yeah, so <laughs> so I'm like, I was on. I remember being on a holiday in like Crete. I think it was in Crete or Rhodes, and I was like in this. I was in it was in the room I was staying in. You know, hot night, the usual, like like absolutely like you couldn't breathe. It was so hot, and it's not like they have air conditioning. And I had my my notepad. I'm listening to the beats I've made. Now I made tons of GI Joe beats, like so many and I'd just been like developing these and, and thinking of ideas I had this one called Dr Mindbender's Lament wrote the whole verse and everything I'm like this is this is sick the beat was kind of cool I've used it maybe a couple of times on the show um but you know like basically was just really into this this track and then I wrote this other one about um kind of almost like a roll call of different characters and all that kind of stuff you know we'll get onto that as well and it, it was kind of like uh, loosely like a story about this 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 operative of action force uh, called Firelinks me going through this story right you know and and seeing you know meeting all of the different characters and all that kind of stuff all the way through and uh, and just you know nerd rap basically before this was the first thing I'd ever really thought about doing as a, as in the kind of nerd rap sphere because most of my stuff prior to that which we'll get onto was very much like. It wasn't, it wasn't the usual hip hop stuff. I mean, it was very much like my experiences as a middle-class white kid in the United Kingdom. Do you know what I mean? So um, it, this was very different for me, but I was really getting into it. And I, I'm writing all these tracks, all these beats and everything. And then your album drops and I'm like, you son of a bee. So I was like kind of both blown away really loved it and and it was on constant like heavy rotation that album still is to this day I've got a record player right here that plays that vinyl on a, on a regular basis but like you know it, it was just constantly on so there was no I wasn't you know angry or anything it was just like that that resentment almost of like I was so I was this close to doing it as well you know like and I thought well okay I've got all of this all of this stuff all of these beats like probably about I mean I've sent them to you didn't I but probably about I don't know for hundred and something tracks and like you know in kind of like the gi joe sphere and and so like i i was like what am i going to do with all this stuff pretty much the next day i'm on the phone to dave tree who is a big big name in the whole you know action force and star wars world as well and and we were like we need to do a podcast about action force and i'm like right let's do it i've got literally i've got everything lined up got the music we can, <laughs> i can edit it everything's fine we can do this i'll host it we'll get you and get another guy on called eddie inman and we with the three of us did this this podcast we really enjoyed it thought it was loads of fun and then shortly afterwards i'm getting to chat to you and like i remember you did a uh, you did a track for flag points and i was like Oh man, I'd love I'd love to do a track with Word Burglar. And I think the next time I saw you was at one of the conventions and we kind of we kind of met properly there, didn't we? Like face to face. And that's when I said to you, I've got a load of beats if you want them. And you're like, yeah, whatever, mate. No, I <laughs> wasn't. I was yeah. like, no, send, great. Send I them over. Them. Yeah. <laughs> this is just listening to that story. And and you know, I you've told me parts of it before. Times, we've, we've yeah, we've we've heard <laughs> and you know, it's amazing. And it's just, I think, you know, people come to you know the same ideas and yeah. come to, and I I would love to hear more about fire links and your character and and you know that stuff um I and, have notebooks absolutely full of those verses somewhere I'm going to have to dig them out at some point and and try and maybe even you know get get some time and and try and knock out the album that I yeah. wanted to do in the first place yeah well your beats are crazy and like you know there's so much there that I just wanted to talk to you about just sure. now but all you know all your beats that you've you've ever shown me and that i've heard on your podcast i'm like oh i love it because you've got the ear for samples and i mean Thank that's you. like you know there's a certain Thank thing you. uh that i know and like when i work with other producers and it's like oh i love that you chose this part yeah. of the sample and you did it and you flipped it this way and you've and you know I... that harkens back to like the classic hip-hop samples and stuff and well i do you want me to, I'll, I'll, I can, I can, I can kind of lead into that a little bit with like my, you know, again, kind of growing up um, as, as a kid in the UK. Well, that's where it, I was heading. I wanted I mean, to know. Hip -hop UK hip hop. I know. Like, well, so UK hip hop was a big thing. Um, and like For before sure. Grime, yeah. before, uh, before the kind of, the, all this kind of different scenes we've got now, UK hip hop was a very vibrant kind of thing. But prior to that, I mean, like I, I mentioned my mom and dad, but they would listen to things like 
they had such a, a broad range of, of musical tastes, you know, from like Led Zeppelin to classical music to, you know, soul, uh, you know, all sorts of like, you know, you kind of like, um, I don't know, kind of like classic for growing up in that era, you know, uh, you know, uh, but again, like dad would listen to, was a folk musician. My dad was a folk musician. He played in, I think, I mean, he always tells the story of playing in Cyprus in one of those like amphitheater type things. He says it's the best thing he's ever done. And he just, you know, guitar and, and vocals and everything and just banged out this set. And, and I kind of, like when I was a kid, he would play the guitar all the time. He hasn't done so much getting, you know, in, in kind of recent years, you know, getting a little bit older, not being able to kind of like be as, you know, uh, you know, as good on the, with the old fingers now. <laughs> but um, he, you know, so he was a, he was a musician. My mom loved music. She's, you know, she always, she's always been into music. And so being exposed to that kind of broad range, you know, it's never like, it really was like from one extreme to the other. It was like, you know, folk, like Nancy Griffith, one, one moment, Stevie Wonder the next. Um, you know, like like I said, Led Zeppelin, Cashmere. I was playing that constantly. Mom and dad had a record player. Yeah. And it's like the one in The Simpsons. You know, in The Simpsons, they have that kind of like, it's like a cabinet. And it's got like, you see the records like in there and you see the record player on it. It was very much like that proper old school wood grain a uh, beautiful cabinet, you know, like needs to be doors. wood. You need oh. the wood grain oh. on Just... any of those old turntables and stereo systems, the wood panels. Yeah, please continue. It, it was exactly like that. Perfect. Yeah. You know, like, and even yeah. like, like these like really decorative gold, like handles and everything that would like flip. Oh, it was just absolutely gorgeous. And so <clears throat> I remember as a kid, like, you know, Stevie Wonder was a, was a like big, I would listen to like superstition, like over and over again. I'd listen to like, uh, cashmere uh, over and over again had the had the 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 vinyl which like that album uh, i think physical graffiti i think it is like the album like cover it's like proper cool and deluxe it's like uh hotel windows cut out and like you slide yeah. it it's just wonderful it's one of the best like piece of vinyl anyway found that for like 30 dollars in a um, like, you know, almost, almost perfection, almost like uh, sealed. It was so good mm. quality. So I had to buy that for the, for the nostalgia of it. Yeah. So I do have that again. Like, um, you know, so I was very much like exposed to lots of different types of music. And with that kind of like, I don't know, just ended up going to this, like, I, I suppose it's the sample side of hip hop, isn't it? It's like, because you're hearing this stuff all the time and mm -hmm. you're hearing certain elements of songs you tend to start picking things up, you know, picking up melody and, and rhythm and, and timbre and beats and all that kind of stuff. You start picking all this stuff up, whether you like like it or not. So like my rhythm was good, you know, like I could, you know, I'd, I'd always be tapping and, and kind of drumming and stuff like that. So I, I could do kind of like very complex little, you know, rhythms and things and uh, from an early age. And it used to drive mom and dad mad, like on the, you know, like the, the dinner table or something. And I'm just like, Pack it's like shut up for five seconds <laughs> did um, you play drums did they wind up getting you a drum kit no i never got a drum kit but um you know i can i can you know i can sit a drum kit and i can get a a, a rhythm out of it no problem but mm. in the only the first time i actually really properly learned to sit at a, the a, a set of drums was way like way into my later years uh, when i started working as a teacher at a music college which we'll get to a little bit later i guess yeah we're yeah. just no, that's great. So your dad played in so, Cyprus. Yeah. 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 And so I mean, Cyprus. That was like his big, you know, he really, that was he, a big he, loves, thing, he yeah. loves talking about that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you that. were sort of aiming to play Cypress Hill, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. That is so true. The um, UK, yeah, there's always, UK hip hop's always fascinating. Oh yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, my I, goodness. There was, you know, what were some of maybe like the, the hip hop groups specifically from the uk like that you remember being like okay wow like i'm proud that these you know i'm from the uk you know well, because of these guys the, i mean there were tons like we would go to uh myself and a couple of friends would go to the junction in cambridge very often and that was like a big underground uk hip-hop kind of scene you know people like foreign beggars roots maneuver yeah roots um, maneuver you know one, like, oh, there's, uh, there's so many like oh i'm having a brain fart but like you know, loads of the kind of like the individual rappers. Um, oh, Lucas with the lid off. Did he ever make it? Was, was that guy? I, I definitely, I definitely, yeah, a hundred percent. But like, I, I just can't, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot basically. The but streets yeah, like, I, would, I think of and. Well, yeah, the streets was, that was definitely like, like later on in my musical mm -hmm. kind of, you know, listening and everything. But yeah, he was obviously huge at the time. Like I think like early 2000s, 
yeah. mid 2000s but like yeah the you know again like that he came with that kind of completely different style and almost like very much like the lad ish culture at the time in the UK like mm-hmm. you know going on holidays and you know to kind of Spain and you know like the kind of the crap you have to deal with in like you know kind of rubbish areas in like the UK and stuff uh, but very much like the experiences of his life and I think that was what UK hip hop was like there was this real like raw kind of like you know there was a real like like a genuine aspect to it you know and I think you know obviously there was a lot of like the American hip-hop was was huge in the UK still like you know we had um it, but it was all very other than the kind of real raw stuff that came out of New York early on it was all very like glitzy because obviously you know P Diddy Biggie mm-hmm. and Mace and all the bad boy crew and all that kind of stuff kind of hit our shores pretty strong um, and then also, you know, the, the West Coast stuff like, you know, Snoop and Dre and, and all that kind of stuff. So, we, you know, we were completely exposed to that. But I didn't really get into hip hop until um, I was still young. I think Loonies came out. I got five on it was like a yeah, big. Yeah, I got five big. on it. I the, got five on it. What that a, was huge. What a tune. That was a huge, yeah. That Honestly. Was a big one. And the fact that they, they got away with it on top of the pops, because obviously that's like a family show. Yeah. And they didn't they didn't censor any of it unless it was a swear word. So they're they're talking freely about like, you know, you know, drug use and all that kind of stuff. And no one's really know it, no, understanding, because there was a bunch of, you know, white guys running top of the pops that don't really understand what the situation is. And but I remember watching seeing that on TV and just being like, oh, that is an absolute tune. But like, you know, we I, we'd we'd had like boom shake the room and we'd had all that stuff from uh, from early on kind of uh, hitting us. So I was I was I, I just loved I love pop music. We had MTV. So like, that was another thing growing up. My dad was, um, he came out of the RAF and he was an electrical engineer for Sky and Sky was like cable, basically. Like right, it, was, right. it was the one company that did like the TV in the UK, basically. For those of us who uh, didn't grow up over there. So Sky, exactly. so how does that fit Sky in with TV. like Channel One? And so there's like- Before that, yeah, channel- we had so- four channels when I was growing right. up. In fact, we had three channels when I was very young uh, BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV, and then Channel Four came about. I want to say like late eighties, and um, I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it wasn't. I wasn't. I was. I wasn't like that. Um, I wasn't that old. It was like you know, I was still very young when Channel Four came about. But those are the four terrestrial channels we had, right? No satellite, no cable. That was it. Then. In the 90s, we got Channel 5 added to that group of uh, channels. So we had five channels. And we're, we're still in the 90s, right? Dad gets this job at Sky, and all of a sudden, we get satellite TV. And it's like hundreds and hundreds of channels, like loads of music channels. But the first like instance of Sky was more basic, and MTV was on there. And I just remember falling in love with it and just being like, you know, Beastie Boys, was probably one of my earliest influences, I would say. Beastie Boys was one of those ones where I saw them and I just wanted to be them. And I wanted to hear their music like 24 seven. Like they Do were you just... remember what album it would have been around that Well, it time? was Fight was for it Your like... Right to Party. Oh was, yeah, was the, so early was stuff. It yeah. was the big yeah. intro to, to Beastie Boys. But then like finding them and finding their music and then like just going, I just, I just complete nerd nerding out for them. Cause I was, you know, and, and things like, I think one, what I'm actually getting goosebumps speaking about it before I'm about to say it, but this, the track for me that will always, it'll get me up on the dance floor. It'll get me hyped. It'll get me like excited visibly. You'll see it. Like I was in, I was in the <laughs> cinema and this song is played in one of the movies and I'll probably tell you in a second. And, um, and that's sabotage when yeah. sabotage comes on, forget it. You've lost me for the for the duration of that song because it is going to be I'm going to be chucking stuff, going nuts. Mm. Just it's just one of those songs that just that does it for me every single time, and that was obviously huge on MTV. You know, and Yo MTV Raps when that came yeah. on, because we didn't. That was the other thing. It wasn't like it wasn't accessible. You couldn't just go and watch it. It was like it's going to be on this time. Make sure you're sitting there and watching it. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Yo MTV Raps was amazing. I love that show so much. Well. And yeah, and I think a big thing that like, you know, I when I'm listening to you and I'm hearing this and what we share in a lot of ways it and I always hate to say because it makes us, you know, sound like, you know, I'm happy with how things are now with the Internet. But remembering the time before the Internet and before 
when the videos, if you caught a video, oh, it was you, the best you, thing ever. It was like, what is this? It was like catching lightning in a bottle, and you yep. never, you may never see it again. What you And there was that, <laughs> yeah. You'd have to just stop everything. I may never see this again. I may never. And we've talked about it. I know with cartoons, yeah. you see an episode of a cartoon. It's like I'm this. I have to watch this one now. chance. Yeah. Did this happen? Uh, so I can only imagine with, you know, only four channels and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, early on, like, and, and then what, will... like, wow. I'm now I'm sure you got a lot of uh, Doctor Who and Monty Python, which we got a lot in Canada as well. A lot of the BBC was funneled. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised because I think with that, that was just the same as the other stuff. If you missed it, you missed it. It, but mm -hmm. like the, the thing is like you knew when it was coming on we had the tv times like a tv guide type scenario and you'd, you'd be able to be able to look to a certain distance you know little, like into the future like oh, oh you know mark off what you wanted to see i remember doing that like at an early age but then when sky came along you could kind of like flick through and see what was coming up for the next like 12 hours so that you know the t the guide on there was really cool so mm -hmm. yeah that it, i didn't have that much of a, of a childhood without that but no when you were talking about you know, us, us kind of moaning, doing the old man thing of like, in our day, um, you can kind of look back, sometimes I look back with like real like, like joy at some of those things. And then sometimes I think, man, I'm kind of lucky that I can just go on and literally I'm watching G.I. Joe as we speak. It's on TV on loop on Tubi. So I'm just, you know, I just watch it, you know, whenever I want to put an episode on and it's just great. So I'm not going to complain about it, but I do. It just makes me kind of very, I don't know, like, um, I, I I can kind of see like I can I I appreciate it more yeah. looking back and going how did I do that on just VHS and comics alone do you know what I mean Yeah well you just you would reread them and rewatch them I mean for me yeah with comics I'd just reread them over and over and over again and then with Until music they were dust, it was basically yeah yeah I would find anyone whose house I'd be you know at who had albums that I'd never seen I'd be like can I come back with like a blank <laughs> tape and just like dub this from you like I would buy these really cheap blank tapes from Wolko and you get like a 10 pack for like nothing Dude. and then you just go around yeah and I just dub other people's albums and on from tape to record CDs whatever and, and I remember <laughs> just to get all that music it's like wow I got all these albums um just quickly shout out to me by the way because yeah. It's amazing. T-U-B-I, for those of you who don't have it. And I'm very, I'd be really interested to know if G.I. Joe is the number one show because, because everybody. Of because of us. <laughs> yeah. But people constantly tell me, they're like, do you know you can get G.I. Joe for free on Tubi? I'm like, yeah, it's been like that for like a couple of years. Now. It's amazing. <laughs> I love it. I, I don't know what it. else people watch on there, but uh, Cops actually, is the other one. Cops, Cops. <laughs> and uh, Tubi and whatever other cool cartoons they have on there as well. They have some great old anime stuff they I'd do. never seen. Absolutely. Uh, just really like early like seventies, eighties anime movies. When you talk, when you talk old school anime, right? I remember like as a kid just being fascinated because it was so, it was so like violent and it was so like visceral and and like really like completely different and obviously the cultures were very different at the time it was a it was it was cartoons for adults but we didn't really think of it that way in the, this kind in our country it was like oh they're weird they watch cartoons that are like crazy insane we even had a tv show where some guy was talking about it and the controversy over it and i remember was it legend of the Overfiend? Like, oh, that was a bad one. <laughs> I remember we were in like, I want to say like in high, no, not high yeah. school, we were in, we were in like junior school and the, the talk mm -hmm. around was someone's got that. And, you know, it's really like crazy and like, you don't want to watch it. Cause you know, it's like, it was like, it was like proper legendary status. I, ne yeah. I never, I don't think I ever watched it as a kid, but I did it as an adult. And I was like, yeah, I'm glad I didn't watch this as a yeah, kid. Yeah, I, I did watch it. It's the same thing. Cause it was just legendary. Your friend's brother had a copy of it. It's like, you Dude, gotta watch Legend of the Overfeed. You know, that's shout like- Shout out to that beautiful <laughs> track you did and video, my friend's brother, because that's something I want to talk to you about is everybody can relate to that. Me growing up, somebody always had an older brother who had like mixtapes and CDs of music you've never like we're like how are you getting this stuff and I remember vividly you know mixtapes like constantly getting mixtapes and they were like you know this is new hip-hop stuff from like straight out you know straight out of New York straight out of like you know wherever straight out of St. Louis straight out of this and I'm just like where where are they getting this stuff from and then eventually CDs 
and they they would just make their way around you know everyone would burn a coffee and then you'd be listening to these like you know really cool underground mixtapes featuring like you know big big names and big music which now would be just just go on spotify and search for it but like you know new jay-z you can't you know that kind of stuff yeah with spotify it's not the same no it's not you know someone else is curating maybe but there's an algorithm and you sometimes get caught up in your own you're in just sort of your own tunnel and you do need somebody else to say, Hey, you know what? Have you ever given this a chance? Oh no, I've yeah. seen it on the, at the store. I've seen it on live. They've never really opened it, played it or listened to it. It's like, no, you got to hear this song, yeah, you know? Yeah, and then yeah. that's when you're like, even now, like, uh, I was just talking to someone about you God and you God from Wu Tang clan who had a solo album and there's, one or two tracks on that album and people were like, Oh, I love Wu-Tang Clan, but it's like, well, do you know this jam? Do you, have you ever heard that's gangster by you God, you know? And I saw esoteric sure. shouted out recently and it's like, that beat is crazy, but it's yeah. like one of those ones you may have skipped over yeah. for whatever reason, but there's, you know, there's so many things like that where you're like, Oh yeah, I gotta. I, uh, man, like this, I mean, there's so much to talk about, but like I got into, I got into hip hop through basketball. I was a semi-professional basketball player at my height uh, oh, in the UK. What? See, yeah. this is, yeah, tell us. See, now let me just, for one second, one of the main reasons other than just, you know, us being friends and we always <laughs> love chatting with you, I, I wanted to have you on here is because I think so many people listen to your podcast all the time and we, you know, myself included, but it, so it's, but I, I haven't heard much about you. You know, you're always yeah. like talking with other people and you've been great. You've graciously had me on and many other folks and doing great interviews and news scoops and talking about, you know, the old Cobra commanders, you know, suspenders are now available. <laughs> or something, you know, got whatever. Joe shoelaces and a, and a belt yeah, buckle. You, yeah. That kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. We needed that. I needed that. Um, I needed that news. I didn't know they were coming out. I've been waiting my whole life for that. Uh, um, but yeah, I need to do Cobra just, Commander suspenders now. Seriously. <laughs> well, how does he keep those pants up? Yeah. Uh, but I've never heard you mention that you played semi-professional basketball. Like this is so this is, this is this is what we want. We want time, the diagnostic yeah. okay. scoop here. Give so, us yeah. What's what's the deal? So early on, like in I would say like you know, so we kind of we get in. I'm kind of I'm into hip hop. I'm into pop music. I'm into all sorts of music. I'm into like you know, stuff that my mom and dad like, but then at the same time, that was another thing as well. I had, I had a very, really kind of healthy, really good, awesome relationship with my folks growing growing up. So I have like, you know, literally- Shout out awesome folks. Love them. Absolutely. absolutely. Love them. And you yeah. know, my whole family as well, like they're, they're, they're just so caring, loving, supportive, you know, you name it, they're, they're brilliant. And we're going to be seeing them soon. They could come in, they're coming out here to, to join us uh, for Christmas. So I cannot wait. It's been two years since I saw them. So um, same here. Yeah. I haven't seen them in forever. Sucks, doesn't it? I'm a big, I I mean, my parents, I've never seen your parents. (laughs) Mate, it's been like 30 odd years since I, uh, since I yeah, never met them. Um, But okay. But I'm big fans of their work. Your parents, they they do, they they, (laughs) They they put some great stuff into the world. Yeah. They do good work. So gross when you think about that. (laughs) Uh, No, they, they've been great. And um, you know, you know, like I said, growing up as a kid, listened to loads of music. So I was listening to music they really lo- loved. I ended up loving it as well. But then kind of going into like, you know, I want to say like kind of junior school, late junior school, high school, which is different where I am to where you guys are. So we would probably hit high school, I think probably around about, what year was it? 92, so I'd have been about 12 years old. Uh, 92 to 97, so five years at high school, right? And then 97, 98, 99, I was at college. Uh, sixth form and then uh, after that you can go to university I didn't go to university I just did college um, which is again slightly different way of doing it than than US Canada etc etc so um, just give you give you like an idea of where we are so in high school I started kind of getting into basketball in a big way and was playing it a lot we'd visited friends in um, in America we had my mom's best friend Kelly who lived in Vegas so we would go and see her um and we would stay with them and it was great so that's where I you know had that I always had that story about 1989 going out and just being in like a toy store and G.I. Joe you know everywhere just loving it every second of it Um, do you remember what was on the racks uh Storm Shadow version two uh he was the carryover from last year 
and then it was um, figures like, uh, oh God, uh, the Tiger Force. So it was, I think I picked up, uh, I want to say Dusty, um, Roadblock, Tripwire, and then Iron Grenadiers, I believe, were on there at that point. And I picked up Countdown, um, who else? a mud fighter, dog fight, and dog fight, and the mud fighter as well. Sweet. And so I managed to get all that, and I had this little duffel bag, and I and I I, I, I ended up best like, trip ever. It was amazing, yeah. amazing. So anyway, you know, enough of that. <clears throat> so, well, to that, just real quick, not to throw you off, but with your action figures and exactly what you were saying right now, when you look at them today, like any that you had as a kid. Do you get that instant, like, I remember being yeah. in Las Vegas in 89, and that's where I got Countdown. Like, so that's, I like, can, it transports if, you. If I, like, when, like, if you, like, looking at Yojo now, or not now, but if I, I was looking at, like, Yojo or 3D Joes or whatever whatever site and looking at the line. These are G.I. Joe websites for our listeners who exactly. may not be familiar. Shout, shout out Carson, 3D Joes. Um, and basically, Big shout out. Yeah. I'd be like, I know where I got that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. You know, I'd be able to tell you exactly where I got mm-hmm. them from. Yeah. Um, through like, obviously like through constant thought over it for many, many years. Like, this is the thing it's, you know, when you see those things on Facebook and it's like, oh, do you remember this? And it's like the intro to Bucky O'Hare. And of course I, why would I forget it? I've, it's been in my life every day since it friggin aired. So yes, I remember it because it's never not on my mind. You know what I mean? Like those kind of things uh, for, for some people, it, I think they kind of get away from that stuff and I've actively basically kind of stayed in it you know i'm still an eight-year-old in my head basically yeah but, um, well same we've never left you know you find something that you love and mm-hmm. you never it's like with me same thing music comics toys it's like i love this stuff once i didn't just stop loving it i'm committed i'm a committed lover <laughs> <laughs> so and true. It, is, it is fascinating when you bump into someone now or it's like, oh, yeah, I had, I think his name was did Storm Shadow as a kid. It's like, yeah, you don't obviously. know. <laughs> you don't remember, like, you don't remember owning Storm Shadow as a kid. I remember, like, yeah, I, I do. I do, I find that quite often. I used to do conventions when I was in the UK with my, my buddy Nick at In Demand Toys. And I was there a few times and, I, you know, I'd, I'd bump into people who were like big fans of G.I. Joe. Not, and again, like, I, it doesn't, you know, you can enjoy G.I. Joe's whatever, in whatever way you like. I'm not Absolutely, judging anyone yeah. for it. But there'll be so many like situations where I'd be like, go, go, let's spark up a conversation about it. And then you realize that they, you know, like you realize, oh my God, I'm like some sort of savant for G.I. Joe. And it's like, you know, you, you kind of put that on other people in a way. You expect them to be of, as knowledgeable and it's not fair. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm not a gatekeeper for this brand, but like, it, you know, you just feel sometimes like, you know, it's like, oh, I love G.I. Joe. And you go, oh, cool. Like, like, you know, they've got a tattoo and all sorts. And you think, well, they are committed. And then they'll say something like, oh, one of my favorite characters. Yeah, Fast Kick. And you're like, sorry, <laughs> sorry, what? What did you just say? Or, or yeah, I'm like that. Okay. But you don't like, that's the thing. Like, I'm not that kind of person that's going to be like, nah, actually, I think we'll find it. Sure. Um, quick kick and fast draw. <laughs> is that what you mean? Oh, yeah. No. And that's, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's it. And everyone interacts with it the same way. And maybe the only toy he had as a kid was quick kick and he got the name wrong then. And, you just always yeah but and, yeah and, and I, don't, I don't have it I, I don't have any, no, no judgment at all but like no. I, I don't I, it's only then that I realized just how ridiculous I've been you know growing up and just like soaking all this knowledge in about this this toy line uh and and it's you well, know why do you think that is I don't know I'm just obsessed I get very obsessed with things I used to go through these like you know little kind of um I suppose like little phases where it'd be like okay now I'm really into turtles and like really into it. So now I'm, that's all I'm, that's all my interest is in. And then I get really obsessed with it and I have to like buy this, that, and the other. And I have to like, you know, read the comics and watch the cartoon and everything, you know, and then it's like, okay, now I'm back on. But GI Joe was one of those things that just stayed constant. It was mm-hmm. always there. It was the only, it was the only really like, there's a few bits and pieces, but I sold a lot of toys when I was a kid, um, when I got to a certain age, but I kept all my GI Joe figures. So, you know, I don't know what, I don't know why it, it was any different, but I felt more, more of a connection to that particular brand. Um, anyway, Absolutely. Yeah, coming, no, I'm same way, but please go back, uh, coming pick back up that to, train of thought. Yeah. yeah pick so, up that ball, pick up the pass. Basketball, right? <laughs> yeah. So high school. Grab the pill. 
about about 92 there's a the like we we get into high school you know fresh out of junior school and all not really knowing what we're doing and uh you know it's PE or whatever and it's like oh we get to play basketball okay cool realized oh yeah I like basketball I've been playing it before I got here actually turned out to be quite good compared to a lot of the the kids in in the team so I was like okay this is neat and then we went to uh, the States again. And I remember just being at that point, that was the obsession had kicked in. And I'm like, NBA, NBA, NBA. Michael Jordan, Chicago Bulls, you know, Scotty Pippen, you know, that, that was me then. I was like, right, th- this is where I, w- I want to be in the NBA. So then I, I kid you not, for that, that point from like 92 to about uh, mid 2000s was just basketball. Like that was my life pretty much, you know, just like focused always playing always like I, I i got like i said i got to a pretty high level played national league in uh the uk which was like one below kind of like the british the the bbl like the the the, the big kind of the big league you know um but national league is a pretty hard league it's um it some of it's televised so uh we did there were some times where there'd been you know we'd been like on you know been filmed and, and on tv and stuff like that which is quite cool um god knows where all that that stuff went um i don't think i ever found i don't even ever, ever, ever known if it, it kind of exists if you know what i mean but if anyone can find yeah, it yeah if you can you, that'd be you, brilliant no you i imagine you, you think could, we'll, we'll see we'll see what we'll i can, see, see what yeah. I can pull out. well if anyone knows so yeah where would that have aired oh goodness like on some sort of cable channel on like you know on some sort of random uh I, I don't know probably some sort of channel I, i've not a clue i just know that what a couple of games we played they were quite big deals and um we yeah like it, for the most part it was like you go to these like you go to like like worthing and manchester and and there'd be like brixton we'd have to play and like all these like really difficult you know like long journeys as well i know not as bad as the us it's not like it's not like you're traveling 21 hours somewhere it's like you you know it's still like three hours or something, four hours but it's enough you don't really want to be doing a four-hour journey just before playing basketball um sitting and cramped up in a in a tiny little uh you know little um friggin bus or whatever so it you know it, it was kind of cool i played for the king's lynn fury you didn't have an amphibious personnel carrier you did not that'd be cool wouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> warthog taking us up taking us straight into the the terror to uh to play ball um yeah we uh yeah so i, I you know played pr- pretty much solidly then for like for years um and i ended up kind of quitting because it just got to the point oddly enough where i didn't enjoy it anymore like it got to be it got to be too serious and too intense yeah and i just wasn't like i wasn't and I wasn't committed enough at that point. Like, I think like when I was younger, I played for Norfolk, I played for the school, I played for college. Um, and like, was, was pro- like, I'm, I'm not, you know, n- modesty aside for a second, I was one of the leading players on, on all those teams. Um, I, I thought I could, you know, I had that belief when I was younger that, yeah, I can do this. I can, I can, you know, I'm, I had loads of like, I wanted to be MJ. So I had loads of tools on the court. I was like, you know, mid range jumper on point three points, shoot the lights out inside game solid if i needed to play big man i could you know like i was six i I think i hit growth spurt when i was 14 so straight away it was like well you're going in you're going in the basketball team you know so i was like six foot something when i was like 14 years old wow yeah and uh i wasn't like i don't think i I didn't feel like i i wasn't really like towering over everybody we we had quite it was quite a you know like quite a tall i mean i don't know what was in the water in uh, north walsham at the time but um, yeah, we had uh, we had some pretty like big dudes, and then I get to national league, and I'm, I've got mates who are like six nine, sure, pushing yeah. seven foot, and it's just a, it's a different thing, you know, it's a different thing entirely. And, and would you go when you'd go on the road? Would you then just go check out the local toy stores? Say, hey, I just got to go see if I can find a, a so, Robo Skull over here. <laughs> I tell you what, I I went probably from like you know, so the end of high school uh 97 no 90 no 94 oh sorry i think i got this wrong 94 95 nice when was 94 yeah no that's right so around 94 right at the start of high school i would say oh yeah 92 my mate matt bales i'm calling him out right now we hit high school and the first thing he does to me we're going into one of these like mobiles it was like a it was a music lesson and it, we were going into this, uh, it was like a separate building, like a storage container kind of classroom. 
And uh, there, were, there were two girls walking up the stairs, Kate and Vicky, who I was like, you know, getting friendly with and quite liked them very much. And I thought, oh, you know, like the, you get that feeling, you know, as a kid. And uh, Matt Bales was a mate who lived down the road from me. Uh, good friend. Still love him to death. He was a, you know, proper good old boy. And but the problem was in this instance, he turned, he, he, he literally he's over there talking to them and he looks over and points at me and says, he still plays with G.I. Joe's. And I was like, you son of a. And he was like, he was really rubbing it in, like almost to kind of like really just kill any chances I had with with either of them. And, you know, fair, fair play. I think he, I think he did that. Um, but the funny thing was the same two girls. Uh, and so this was the nail in the coffin, actually, for, for toys. The same two girls, Claire and Vicky, decided to take a bike ride from where they lived in North Walsham area to where I lived in Munsley at the time, which was still a long journey. Like, you know, this is the kind of thing we did as, as younger people. Like, you'd, you just go for a bike ride for 20 odd miles, you know, it's a random stuff like that. The best. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Anyway, they, it's, it was only, you know, you're only talking like, I don't know, like five or six miles, really, maybe even seven miles, I would say. Um, so still quite a, a, a trip and it's not it's not flat and it's not downhill so you know you're struggling most of it they they come out to see to, to my house and this was without like sat nav that they just they just knew my address somehow and they get there I'm not in at the time I'm around a mate's house at that moment in time I come back and mum said oh uh Claire and Vicky are here they're up in your room and I was just like my you know how like you just you your heart sinks because you're like they're in my room. My room looks like an, a, a six-year-old child is, you know, is, is in there right now. It's just like posters of Manchester United football players all over the wall and one Steel Brigade poster, or one special call. Of course. And but a cabin bed with stickers on it, you know, like a white cabin bed Perfect. with a little desk, little uh, plastic dinosaurs, had all my G.I. Joes on the windowsill, including a Sky Striker, believe it or not. So shout out to the Sky Striker. Congratulations for funding. But that was <laughs> that was on there, getting sun bleached by the, the ridiculous choice to put it on a windowsill. So, uh, yeah, I get in there and they, it, it was just like, you know, oh, you know, kind of taking taking the, the mickey, shall we say, like very poking fun a lot of. But then, you know, did they like did they think the toys were cool? Yes did- and no. There was a lot of judgment. They clearly were into whatever vibe you were giving. So the toys think, just came with that. You know, that's that's part well, of it. Well, I'll tell you now, as soon as they left, it was like, right, posters down, you know, like yeah, dinosaurs away. Uh, <laughs> and there was like Jurassic Park dinosaurs in there as well. Like so some proper <laughs> good ones, um, you know, like Transformers away, G.I. Joe stuff, put all packed away. It was like a proper minimalist bedroom after that. Do you know what I mean? It was just the SNES or the NES that was that was sitting out with the little TV, the little like you know cathode ray TV. So um, yeah, I, I at that moment it was like right, I need to kind of I need to you know switch it up a little bit. So well, the, the whole point of the basketball thing was to really say that that's where I got into hip hop in a big way. So mm-hmm. we would uh, train like when I was playing for the North Norfolk Bombers. Um, when I was playing for those guys, um, my mate Paul Skillen, huge hip hop fan, amazing basketball player, he bought one of those JVC boom boxes. Do you remember those proper like tube boom boxes? Big old oh yeah, buggers. yeah. I've CD got player. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got a Panasonic back here, but uh, yeah. Do you remember the JVC cool. ones? They had the kind yeah. of like like all the detail, like they look like industrial. They look really cool. Yeah, those were sweet. They were round, right? They yeah. were bigger, and you could just portable. They took like. 10 batteries <laughs> it took 10 big ass batteries yeah yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. they took 20 batteries actually now that i think about it but i remember like a lot <laughs> it, was, it was yeah they drained yeah. those and i remember he would bring that to the training plug it in and we'd be listening to like fuji's we'd be listening yeah. to you know like it would be it would, and also it was like it was like fuji la and and ready or not and all the classics off the album just banging and i'm not sure what it is but but when you're playing basketball and you're listening to music it makes you like 400 times better. Like you, you're just feeling everything. You're playing almost in a rhythm, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. So like we, yeah. we really vibed off that. And um, yeah, that was one of the, that was one of the, the kind of driving forces to me wanting to kind of actually get into hip hop in, in a big way back then. And were you, were you even dabbling in making beats then? Or did that just come a bit later? 
funny story. So first time I ever wrote, because I wrote rap, I wrote a rap first before I ever made any music. And I remember uh, I was probably about, I want to say like 13, 12 or 13. And I remember coming down the stairs, going into the living room to my dad and do it and reciting it for him in front of him. And he was like, actually, yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, and he was quite impressed. And I was like, okay, cool. You, you know, and dad, again, is very supportive. He's not going to say, bugger off, that was rubbish. But, you know, I was, I was kind of like, at that point, I was like confident enough. Like I felt, you know, I was a good writer, rough, you know, I could, you know, good, good kind of um, grasp of grammar. You put English. a couple of words together. Put, yeah. put a few words together. I can burgle yeah. a few words, not as many as <laughs> you, mate, but, yeah. but yeah, like, I, and so like, I was kind of like, you know, I, again, got the rhythm down. It wasn't very, it wasn't basic. I was trying different like patterns. I wasn't just like, it wasn't like that kind of thing where the nursery rhyme thing, which kind of makes you cringe a little bit when you hear you know, somebody doing that, but in like a non-ironic way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, like my name is this and I'm here to yeah, say. say. It's yeah, like that's, that's, yeah. That is literally, isn't it? That's the it's one. What that's everyone the... does. Yeah, it's that's the one. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to look back at that notepad and be like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it says. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I was talking about. That's um, it's your first start because that's what you do. You're introducing yourself. Do you know what, what I found? What I found <laughs> off what I found initially, though, with rap was that it wasn't necessarily the words. That sounds ridiculous. It was the way you kind of present it. It's the way you kind of put it out there. You know mm -hmm. that more than than, than most, I, I know. But like, for me, it was like finding that out and realizing, oh, okay, so I can make this as goofy as that sounds like to, to you know, like just, just without context. I can actually make that sound good just by doing it a certain way and not in like a complex way, but just like finding like, finding that rhythm finding that kind of mode where the where the, the words just become almost like part of the beat rather than just like lyrics you know yeah and um yeah and I think that was one of the things when I learned that early on it made it a lot easier to write and um I was always one of those people that needed subject matter so if I had a if I had something I was rapping about an idea as soon as I got that idea and I was like oh yeah that sounds cool I would literally it would just come out it would flow out and you'd write it and it would be done you know, the worst things is when it's like, I have to write this and you sit down and you're trying to like force it out. It's like, I felt like it was always when it was like, you know, the least like three in the morning when I'd, I'd wake up and be like, oh my God, I just, yeah. And let's get it down and things like you that. You got to write it down. Yeah. And I, I know just for me, I would memorize stuff when I couldn't write it down. I would just like, I have like, over I have to say this again. to myself yeah, over yeah, and over. Yeah. I'd be on my paper route and I'd be like, I have to just keep saying it over and over and over. And so I know it. And then uh, I think that helped me learn to memorize stuff. Totally. But, uh, I never, and the, the, I'm, I was, I'm bad at that. I'm bad at memor memorizing things. Um, I can get through like, you know, basic stuff I've done over and over again, but I couldn't recite. I don't think I could recite one single verse until the music came on. Uh, the beat down a touch. That's it. That's good, man. That's good. I like it. Yeah. Uh. Uh, now let me tell you a little story about this boy I call Chris I should say man cause the boy's 26 And he still is with his parents in the middle of the six No wife to provide for And he doesn't have kids No occupation to get up for And he doesn't give a ish Now he's wandering around the house while half undressed But you know like you as a rapper like you know you write the words Done you, you get your track and everything But then it was like a matter of how do I create music You know how am I making music out of this The first thing I've ever had music production wise my dad bought me cubase which was yeah. like at the time was like like an industry standard kind of you know like very intricate complex musical like thing like you needed yep. like a, you need to you needed a degree to really work it at that age so i kind of like had that but all i could figure out how to use it for was sampling which isn't a bad thing because it's where i managed to get like certain tracks you know certain pieces of music into the computer and then like and i'd be used i'd use that like that cubase i forget what it was called um you you know people listening to this will probably remember but it had almost like a you know the adobe illustrator to photoshop kind of thing where it's like you could just be slicing samples and and stuff like that and i forget what it's called. yeah i forget because i know like kills who i work with fresh kills i'm pretty He'll sure know. he used to use yeah he used to use cubase and uh i think it was kills and Kills or Timmy, but I think it was Kills had it. But yeah, sorry, go on. I, I'm oh, familiar cool. with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, 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 you know, I was really, you know, uh, I thought it was amazing. 
but like that's all I could really do with it. I didn't have a microphone. I didn't have a mixer or a audio interface or any of that stuff. It was just literally your basic plug in and go kind of thing. And as I kind of, funny enough, as I was as I was kind of going, hip hop EJ. Do you remember that? It was almost like the put it. It was like almost like the Lego bricks of of music making. It's always very was it on basic. PlayStation. No, that was Make the Music two thousand, which okay, I remember yeah, my mate one. had. Yeah, I, that, that one. Was, yeah, I remember that. Made some good beats on that, mate. Don't don't knock it till you try it. I put a whole no, EP out on the. Uh, I put a whole EP out on e- hip hop EJ. Uh, very young, obviously, but my goodness, that was that was where I learned. You know, v- strangely enough, verse, chorus, structure. Mm-hmm. You know, bridges, all that kind of. Stuff. It's kind of where I learned all that stuff. Obviously, from listening to music, but then actually, when you make it, bar structure very important. You know. Uh, BPM set that early and 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 work off that all that kind of stuff you know making drum patterns and all that kind of stuff so I use that almost as like a basic kind of 101 to get into using Cubase started using Cubase more and then it was a, a matter of um, I think from that it was like Fruity Loops because my mate had a a free version of that so then obviously yeah you fruity that. loops many many beats were made on fruity loops. many beats that came out on like labels and indie like Ninth a lot wonder of, used yeah. it like constantly didn't he like that was his that was his jam Ninth. yeah fruity loops. i think to this day there are still like some of my favorite beats i've heard of been were of fruity loops and you know certainly like in my crew like people were messing with fruity loops it was i think great. it was like free right it was pretty accessible yeah, it yeah. Was, well it was free for me because my mate had a yeah cheeky copy of it there you um, go cheeky I mean, copies Love i mean them. this this stuff was a lot of money as well like you, you you're talking big money for this stuff aren't oh, you? oh it was nuts well, even getting like when pro tools was first coming out it's like how could you get pro tools and logic and everything i think oh, logic yeah, did logic, logic evolve from cubase no, it might like, have done I, it might have done because i know that yeah. um it, I, I know obviously it was it's kind of like uh apple based to a degree isn't it i mean it's got it's got kind of like now they're almost garage band and 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 logic are almost you know you, you can't really tell them apart but um i re- like i remember uh, logic for, you're using logic for the first time actually learning to use it rather than just working it out um like i went to a college late in like after i'd done college uh, i went back as a mature student to a place called access to music in norwich and this was I'm, wait I'm you were mature i don't think you were ever <laughs> mature <laughs> i went back as an immature mature student um, but I'm, sorry I'm, too easy too i'm easy. jumping some some i'm jumping some through some hoops here before getting to this but effectively that's where i first saw and started to use and was trained on logic and that's what i use now as you know because it's it's my it's my go-to basically but um i've got some yeah cool stuff that happened before then i started like i said i was starting i was getting into making music in that way um had a ton of beats and i ended up kind of like building this beat library uh loads of them and then started recording probably in the late 90s early 2000s was when i started actually recording stuff and i would i made this ep um called um money is the root of all evil was it that i think something it was something like that i, I forget now because it's been so long oh okay so me and my mate afan i'll, I'll shout afan out he was a guy i met in hunstanton when we moved from munsley to hunstanton so i was probably about maybe 21 and moved to hunstanton and i meet Farn. i'm wearing some jordan sneakers some 11s right the classics uh i think they were the all white uh, NBA All Star versions, right? With yeah, the, the kind of yeah. like that really lovely, like light blue, kind of under the sole, like real sexy. Yeah. Oh my god, I love those. Anyway, I, I'm walking to this video shop in Hunstanton, and there's a fan with his mate Michael, Mike, and he's got a basketball in his in, under his arm, and he see he clocks me, and he sees the Jordans, and we instantly had this like, hey man, you like basketball? Yeah, do you want to play? We're going to go up to the to the wreck and that shoot around. Do you want to come? I'm like, yeah, sure. So that's how I met this guy called Afan, who um, we did. We basically started this little kind of rap group together called Diagnostic and Detox or Detox and Diagnostic. He was Detox. I was Diagnostic. And I came up with this name because I wanted a, I wanted a cool production name that sounded like, you know, like, you know, productiony, but then also a bit cool. And I, yeah. I, I remember Diagnostic came up and I'm like, yeah, I like that. I really like that. But I'm going to put a K on it 
because it was the German spelling and I had that German those little German roots in my life. So I thought, yeah, I'll go with the German spelling and, and do it a little bit different. I like that. Uh, so it's not it's not street spelling. It's German. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you. And that's it's it has it that cool. sound. And this was it sounds like a 90s rap yeah. name. Like and I mean that with all love. <laughs> Zero and, but respect. it's like, <laughs> but no, 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 no. No, I know what you're saying. No, I know what you're saying. It's like and diagnostic. And, and I wondered even with the 80 if it was like, oh, is it because I like am a symptom of the 80s? <laughs> you know, or it's like the well, diagnosis, you diagnose the 80s. So it well, works now. Yeah, right? there's, there's a few levels to it, but really that was an accident. So I um I think it was I think it was because I don't remember the ins and outs really, but it's it's a it's a relatively recent thing that happened when I did a track with a, another producer. Uh, called Luke Sanger or Duke Slammer, as he was known for the for the uh, for the EP that we did, and it was a track called What For, which is an absolute banger, by the way. What is all of this chat, Aaron? What the fuck does it matter when all I can manage is not to roll over the palette? It's staggering how I find time to ignite flows on such a level that blows hot air directly up your bum holes. I'm a self-deprecating, never self-medicating, reprobate with a penchant for a healthy celebration. Don't drink, don't smoke. I've never done a drug, especially not coke, and I never in my life will. So don't poke. Like he is a, an amazing musician. He makes incredible beats. He does hip hop. He does dance. He does EDM. He does all sorts of cool stuff like the guy is you know amazing he's so talented and we did um this little ep together and he was doing uh, prs you know the, the performing rights society stuff and he needed to know what name to put it under and he like i had been going by diagnostic for ages and so he i think put me on there as diagnostic um, and then, but then I would, I, uh, someone else, I can't even remember what happened, but I know that 80 got attached to it by accident. And it was only, I think it was because um, I'd written it out and I'd said it in a track and 80 had something to do with, oh, that's my year of my birth. That's why. And that's why it was attached to it. But then he accidentally put it on there doing the PRS stuff. So, and, and I kind of looked at it, I'm like, actually, that's kind of cool. I quite like that. I'll just keep it. So that's what I ended up staying with. But it was like diagnostic was the original name. And then the 80 kind of moniker was accidentally added to it doing a well, PRS it's great thing. It, it differentiates it yeah. as well, right? From the, you know, if someone else were to call themselves diagnostic or something. Exactly. Yeah, right? exactly. But like, and it's, it's just gives a nice thing. Plus it's very hip hop. It's very graffiti writer, uh, you know, adding the numbers at the end. <laughs> and no, it's great. It's diagnostic it's, it's, 80. But... It's very Twitter handle, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to get well, the own, no. I'm going to get I, the 80th diagnostic on this yeah. one. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, there's certain rap names and I joked about it before on the podcast where everyone has heard someone with that name. It's like, yeah, you didn't go through a list. Like this was your first choice. You just wanted to call yourself this. You, and you, like you hear it, don't you? And you and you you kind of like you hear it and you go i like that and then it just stays it stays with you because you feel it's natural um sometimes you'll change it halfway through but like a, a lot of the time it's like you get it you you want it and you're like that's it that'll do for me you know yeah well i mean i knew i literally knew two different rappers from two different cities in canada who shared the same name and uh it was and then but that name was already taken by a famous west coast rapper and it's just like, you just think it's like, you know, you got to look, you know, you got to look yeah. it up, but you know, the, the numbers help you differentiate. And, um, and I, I, I kind of liked it and it was, yeah, it was fun. It was but anyway, I, I put yeah. out the two of us, we did, uh, we, we, we called ourselves justice league. Um, and so there was, well, elements, that's not taken. Yeah. There was <laughs> elements of, I mean, there was cracking. just us league at the time and obviously yeah. justice league. And so we, we kind dope, of, dope. It, it was all very like low level, just kind of us, uh, producing it, putting it on CDs and selling it to our friends effectively is what we were doing. We were mm -hmm. really hustling back then. And, um, you know, then uh, through Farn, he he went to um, Corn he went to Cornell for university and he ended up meeting all of these like hip hop guys, producers, rappers and stuff like that. And one of the guys made these like this amazing set of beats and he sent them to me saying, do you know, do you want to use some of these? Do you want to kind of create something? And I ended up making an entire album out of that called iron fist and uh, i even i did the 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 um <laughs> i did all of the artwork for the cd which was effectively i drew do you remember in gi joe transformers uh the one of the 
maybe the second crossover where I think it's like Thundercracker Transformers in the clouds and the, the, the Sky Strikers are flying after him and then they come out of the clouds and Thundercracker's there transformed and they're like, what? And they're all like, you know, he destroys them. Do you remember that? I'm and drawing the, a blank. Is this a Marvel crossover? No, it was it was like it was like Devil's Due or, uh, oh, the, or one of those. Oh, the Devil's Due one. Yeah, because Devil's Due did about four different ones. I I I don't remember that right now. But well, there was, there was a. I thing, believe it happened. I think I think it's either Thundercracker <laughs> or Skywarp. I think it's Thundercracker, and he's like he's like a basically he's a transformed Rattler, and it looks amazing. And I remember nice. drawing that freehand, look copying it, and that because it was the the Iron Fist type thing, and I kind of nice, and I used that as my uh, my artwork for it. I've caressed the beats, philosophies, hypotheses with the spirit of Sophocles. My lyrics are like my modeling prophecies. As I stand proud with the confidence of Socrates, shoot to the future, hoping to expand monopolies. Imagine me in this industry, what with labels dropping me. There's no stopping me, making a mockery of this hip hop property. And I check the policy, so you better stop knocking and mocking me as I hit this track like Fogarty. But I remember. That I need out. to see and hear these. Oh mate, I was playing it to Kate the other day and we were buzzing off it was hilarious like there's some honestly there's some tunes on there that i've i've like you know obviously it's very you're talking like proper guerrilla warfare productions like quality like some of yeah, it's I'm, it's a bit hit and miss i'm but, well familiar with that style of yeah. uh, production it's yeah, i got a couple of those <laughs> but it, it you know there was some absolute bangers like uh, yeah i'll uh i'll send you i'll send you it and i'll play a few obviously on this well cool cool you can play a few on this uh particular episode yes it, like. it is my podcast <laughs> <laughs> look at me Take no it i love it i love it though because again you you know you do you're, you're so prolific with the podcast and this is i'm loving hearing all the musical history and i, I do want to talk about the podcasting a bit as well we'll but, get to um so with this the so your group justice league you were doing these tracks yeah, we did then, like two we did two mixtapes put them on cd sold and them did you have the plan to like you know tour these or like shop them around to labels we did what we was did the, what was well, the plan? The, the, again we're talking like we were young we were like early 20s at the time and it was like uh you know not really knowing what to really do with it or not really knowing so we were doing it kind of for fun but then with this like idea of well let's do as many live shows as we can we did a live show in cornwall but we did loads of new music that fan and i were working on like a couple of like i went out there and met and hung out with him for like a month and towards the end of that month, we did a show at his university, which was really cool. Um, but then we spent the whole time in, in the recording studio. It was amazing. Like this beautiful university level recording studio. It was superb. So we got lots done then. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we were doing all of this kind of stuff, like in our early 20s, putting loads of music, out, like trying to put music out, but not really knowing how to do it. And obviously, this is before a lot of your kind. I mean, it was basically the MySpace era. We're talking mm. about MySpace music is what we were doing. That's what we were making. We were, we were hoping people would hear it on there. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Um, but never, it didn't really go anywhere. Like, um, you know, we, we just kind of did it because we enjoyed it. And once it's the best we, reason to do it. That's exactly. The, the exactly. only reason to do it, really. So we kind of churned out, you know, quite a bunch, a lot of music in, eventually. Mm. We, we churned out a lot of stuff, but then never really went anywhere. And then I ended up going, um, meeting this guy called uh, Max Alexander. The Lounge Lizard was his was production name. And I, well, I that's was- a good name. I was in a, a college class in college called Classical Civilization, about ancient Greek and Rome. I wanted to do history, but it was in the same block as this other one I wanted to do in, in English. So it was like, okay. So I did class, class Civ instead. It was a small college. That's why, it, you know, uh, you know, those kind of, options this guy called louis alexander i was uh in the class with lovely guy got on well really well with him we had a good good time uh and then one random day we are we are like i think we got to like lunchtime and we're, we go out we you know we're outside and he's like do you guys want to come back to mine for lunch i think you know um we've yeah you know we've got and, and i was kind of like yeah sure so a bunch of us got in a car drove to his place it was just like probably about two miles away drove there we get to this long drive. We put, we got driving that long drive. Like it was so long. It was like half the journey that we just, just done. Right. And all of a sudden this huge mansion starts appearing and we're like, is this your, is this your place? And he's like, oh yeah, this is my mom and dad's. They're just, you know, but I thought we could have lunch here. Cause it's like a nice little spot there. And I'm like, okay. So we get to this house and we're all like the, 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 I think there were four of us in the, in his class, just like, what the hell? hell like we are in some sort of like old english 
mansion like it, it's incredible right it's it's huge like hundreds of rooms this thing is gigantic that obviously they've got money right anyway we're like louis what does your what does your what do your parents do and he said well they don't really do much anymore but dad was in genesis <laughs> and we're like what wow so he was the guitarist for genesis for a short period for a period of time so obviously he made a lot of money uh, in the early days of genesis i think when peter gabriel was was kind of heading him up before oh um, i thought you were talking about like the music for like altered beast and everything for, so the <laughs> sega. Sega, Gen- sega genesis <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar. I, that, uh, yes i'm familiar with that actually genesis. i think you'll find that <laughs> yeah no um but no it, we were just like blown away we were like wow his his uh, like keep on the low his dad, was a, his dad was a bit a bit of a he was a he was a hard kind of guy do you know what i mean like <laughs> It was difficult to like, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, yeah, you, you can guess what I'm saying. I'm not going to be nasty yeah. to him. But. No, you never forget the mean parents you meet in your life. For Louis' mom was There's lovely. Like, yeah. Absolutely lovely. The dad was a bit harsh. Um, you know, I see that now when I meet someone, I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's a hard parent. That's a tough, you know, or you see someone's on TV, a politician or something. Like I just exactly. don't like them. They seem like a mean dad. Exactly. <laughs> so, right. Okay. So we're in his house. Anyway, his brother comes out, Max, and he's, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, nice to meet you. He's younger brother. And um, he was, he, we got to chat in and Louis said, oh, Chris makes music. Uh, you guys get on, get on really well. And that was it then. Like, we just were like talking about hip hop and stuff and like the kind of stuff we were listening to at the time. And and then he said, yeah, I've got a studio if you want to see it. And I'm like, mm, yeah. So we walk into the other wing of this mansion and he takes us into wow. this gorgeous room. Like on the second level, there was like this beautiful view of the garden um, throughout all the windows, this kind of big open room with a pool table in it, right? And then through this, go through this little doorway and it was just this old, beautiful room packed with equipment, with instruments, with all, it was, a, it was a mess, but it was a beautiful mess. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and he was like, yeah, like got his laptop out, played me a couple of beats. And I'm like, dude, I've got some, I've got some verses. We can, we can, not, we can knock some tracks out. And he was, he got really excited. And yeah, that's kind of how we ended up meeting. And then I ended up going to like, so, okay. So he, we, we basically, basically he started a, um, a label called Gordon Bennett Records, which was a brilliant, like, it's like a, it's like an old, um, you know, Gordon Bennett, it's like an old English kind of like, a, you know, like, it, it, I don't know, like a term that they, that's used in like a, you know. Gordon Bennett? is oh, I've... Gordon Bennett. Yeah, it would be like a, I don't ask me where it comes from. It's just a very old English term to mean like, oh, damn it, or, oh, you know, goodness me or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Interesting, because so, in Canada, the Gord is a very uh, stereotypical name here, right? And they say everyone who's famous in Canada is Gord or Gordon. So I didn't, <laughs> Gord Downey, well, Gord, do you know Gord Downey? You know Tragically Hip? Did you? No. Wow. Yeah. Gord Downey, Tragically Hip, you're about to discover a whole world of music. I'm in he, it. Uh, he died a few years ago, but oh, no. the band, yeah, they're arguably Canada's greatest rock band ever. Don't you think? Uh, I don't think I've ever Story heard of Rush them. fans. Yeah, I mean, this is a whole other thing, but I'm always curious how many Canadian musicians and artists made it across the pond that people even know about. So if you've never heard the Tragically Hip, have you heard of Gordon Lightfoot? Yes. Okay, so the, he's an older... By accident, Canadian. by the way, because I was holding up one of his uh, records because it had Lightfoot written on it and uh, then got got uh, listening to it. And yeah, yeah so I, I know Gordon Lightfoot completely by accident because of G.I. Joe. I never connected that maybe Lightfoot got his name because his parents were Gordon Lightfoot fans. I don't know. I've literally... <laughs> like I've, li- history. I've got a picture of me holding his vinyl, I think. I'll have to dig it out somewhere. Yeah, Gordon Lightfoot's great and tragically hip or amazing so yeah gord downey just an incredible human and uh yeah there was just he just released a new they just posthumously re- released a, a a new song of his but yeah the tragically hip I'll look t- them I'll up done and yeah it's a shame they never got that big outside of canada oh, which sucks. is mind-boggling because they're huge here you you won't find a Canadian who hasn't heard of Tragically Hip. I know you found you found a British guy that hasn't heard. Of yeah, it, right? yeah. So and but it's funny when you say Gord. What is? Gordon oh yeah, Gordon Bennett? Gordon Bennett. Yeah. So okay. that was the that was the name of the the record label, and yeah, look, we basically said like, well, let's put an, an EP out. Let's see how it does. Yeah, we did we did we went through the whole kind of motion of getting this EP out. We uh we did a couple of gigs, 
um and it was great like the actual the uh, it's one of my fa- one of the one of my favorite things i've ever done as a as a project and uh again it's it's basically just me rapping and him making the beats and it's 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 called we basically called our group Raptilian. I'm a brush mug, but watch me grab my gold nads. Now everybody's gonna wanna know what I'm known as. Barbaric style like Arnie and Conan dropping bombs on you. The tap that I phone pass. Me and Maximilian are on to make a billion on t-shirt sales alone for Raptilian. Name drop on a dot, set these people free again. Yes, boys and girls, it's a lizard of me again. Because he was the lounge lizard and I rapped. So it was Love it. it. That's a great name, Raptilian. Yeah, Raptilian. Uh, the EP was called the Trial and Error EP. It was on iTunes. I'm not sure if it's still on iTunes because you know, after a while, if you're not like really keeping up on it, they uh they just take stuff off uh or it's really hard to kind of find you could throw it up on Bandcamp or something now for sure yeah i, I mean that's one of those ones that i absolutely adore um i need as, to get as, a copy regardless so uh, you'll you'll yeah. i'll send you some it's it's incredible yeah. so there was a track on there like it was it was kind of it was fun it was very very uk hip-hop but in mm-hmm. a good in a good way because like there was a lot of uk hip-hop back then that was very dark everything was very like you know miserable and very aggressive and our stuff was very kind of like, I mean, it was, you know, it was fun. There was like, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of like, it, it was like poking fun a little bit at hip hop in, in what, what our experiences. Like one of the tracks was called Oh My Word. And it's just about like all of this, the crap things that happen to you at a gig. The DJ has been on for a couple of minutes. The MC is shouting a load of stuff, but nobody can hear it. I'm standing directly under a small leak in the ceiling, but that seems to be enough to warrant my attitude being livid. I paid a fiver on the law and a couple of quits. I hang my jacket. I'm only drinking still water, but it still cost me a friggin' packet. Came to the club with a hundred and leave with an abundance of leaflets and flies and the buzz in my ears that is a racket. Like if you're just watching a gig, like you go there and the sound system's terrible and it's like, every gig we went to they just always turn it up so loud that you just can't hear anything anymore it's just like and that's like and it's like well i'm not really enjoying this because i can't hear you say what you you know um it's just i always found that really like funny and like every gig like you get like a a leak from the ceiling hitting you on the shoulder and you're just like what is going on here oh my word oh my (laughs) word oh my word the floor is shaking yeah it's amazing you'll uh you'll love that one um uh, there was a track there about superheroes as well. Look to the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. Hip-hop savior all in a day. D to the R to the A to the G and O-S-T to the R to the K. Heart in the sky, patrolling the airways, making it safe in the name of fair play. I thought when I travel heaven's stairway, a little more stressed to take the hair gray. I will be triumphant, no more let-ups. I see these fools and awful get-ups. Fall into traps and all these setups. Super things get stopped, they must be fed up. Think of a plan that's not ridiculous. Stick to it, man, it's so predictable. Always telling me the master plan and put me in situations I can wriggle out. Look to the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. It's, it's like real quick. It's like super fast. Like, you know, like one of those kind of jobs. Yeah. But it tells a story about a superhero and a supervillain. And then the final verse is uh, the supervillain and the superhero going back and forth. And he's trying to save the the the, the damsel in distress uh, who doesn't need saving. And, you know, that kind of thing. There's a lot of kind of commentary in there and stuff like that. But it was very fun. And and then it ends in this like cliffhanger and it's like to be continued kind of thing. So like there was lots of fun stuff like that that we kind of exp- experimented with. But there was it's some there's some bangers on there. No filler. No filler for Raptilian, cause man, we make the killer tunes. Skipping ain't an issue, cause the album will be listened to. No digging all these others who are killing all these other tunes. I guarantee your awful album won't be played or listened to. No filler for Raptilian, cause man, we make the killer tunes. Skipping ain't an issue, cause the album will be listened to. Not digging all these others who are killing all these other tunes. I guarantee your awful album won't be played or listened to. Is another bang a track and that's about you get these albums and there's always filler tracks on them you know so this is what it's all really about our experiences with hip-hop and and how we we were just kind of poking fun at it a little bit but yeah that was oh, really yeah. good that was really cool Don't. i'm gonna have to send you all of this stuff, reptilian loads, yeah I, I need loads. to i definitely gotta dig deep well because i know and even just hearing your beats and and everything it's like you know okay well this guy like when you first sent me the beat packs I was like, okay, this guy knows how to put beats together. No, he's, <laughs> he's he knows what he's doing. He knows how to make the samples. And I know we've we've spoke before, like your influence, like MF Doom on some oh, of your beat production. MF Doom and, is and like, some like, of your beats. Yeah. yeah, I was so upset to hear about him passing. Like, like last year, that was that was terrible. And yeah, like, and yes. so in typical MF Doom maneuverage, like no one had a clue, and then like three months later, it's revealed, and you're like, yeah. It was terrible. I was absolutely de- devastated. That's I think gonna that- sting forever. Yeah, and well, this year though, Gift of Gab as well from Black Delicious. <sighs> it's just like, like I don't know. I think we get to that age, don't we? Where and and like I'd, I'd say we get to that age, but we're not really at that age where people should be dying off. But I think like you know the the people that we're kind of looking up to when we were kids 
we're seeing a lot of that, aren't we? We've seen a lot of them kind of passing on and it's just terrible. Yeah. I mean, it's with these rappers though, they're so young. Right. And you just hear these stories and like there's Biz Marquee, you know, of course was like a pioneer. So like, yeah, I mean, in the last year, Biz Marquee, Gift of Gab and MF Doom have just been huge. And then mm-hmm. there's so many others, but for me, those were all huge influences. Uh, and I just love, you know, we'll, we'll always have their music, of course. But, I was um, definitely yeah. like MF Doom was a big influence on me, a hundred percent, especially with the way I, I like he he got me into I suppose nerd rap more than anything else, and not in the rap aspect, but in the the beat making aspect because he would sample tons of these amazing cartoon kind of uh, soundtracks, and I think the one that really sticks out to me is the 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 sample he used of the Hulk um, intro, the kind of you know the dun 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 yeah. dun. Da, da, da. like just that is just uh, you know one of the absolute bangers for me and like all those like special herbs and and like all those kind of bit releases where there's just all the beats and it's just oh loved all that stuff loved it yeah so yeah, uh, yeah massive massive inspiration um my other big inspiration um is is dj premier and he was he was the guy who as grown up and i was listening to music he was the guy that I would be open, the, the CD open or whatever it was, uh, inlay who, who, who's produced what, right. There's the premiere track that's going first. Listen to that one straight away. You hear the, in the boom bat, but you hear the, the scratching on the chorus. And it's just like, there's something about that, the way he used to find the perfect sample to go in with that particular, like create the, the chorus. And I yep. love that about DJ premier. Um, I've kind of like very, very rudimentarily tried that myself with certain like, uh, you know, like I, I, I would do that with certain things on the, the G.I. Joe beats where I would take like little samples of their vocals and try and make little choruses out of them. So as much as like I, I've never really been able to get that, get it down. It's, there's, I mean, you know, there's a real talent there and it's about the memory as well, like remembering all those verses and lines where it's like, I remember that and and I know you do it too. You do it on all your music, which is always like blows me away that, that, that those little snippets are found and they always sound so, so, so cool. Yeah. Well that, I mean, and you're talking about just sort of like the vocal samples or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, I mean, in itself, it's more when I hear something, I'll write it down and like, I have to, and there are things I've heard years ago and I still haven't used or things that have just been sitting on forever. It's like, this will work. And there's a real art to it. And, you know, you meet certain people like within hip hop. I mean, that's, you know, some other, you know, electro and techno, they EDM, they'll do it too as well. Yeah. Like a lot of, a lot of industrial albums do that and they sample obscure movies and things like that. So. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you, you just have to kind of remember, or you just be like, I think, there was a movie where they said this in it. Well, and- that's what I have to do with the podcast all the bloody time. Cause it's like, I'll be talking to Pat or I'll be talking to Justin and they'll say something really obscure. And then I have to go and find the bloody thing. And that's, it's the similar kind of thing. Like, but like you have that memory of it, but then you're trying to find it. Usually it's visual now with the podcast, but like, you're right. Like with the, with the music stuff, it's like being able to like, remember that that was said and then go, oh, that'd be good for this. Cause that's about, that's about the same subject matter. And then that rhymes with this. And that was also another thing that will work really. It's like, that is another, le- that's like an, an, encycl- an encyclopedic knowledge of, of music. And that is something that I've always been really, I always admired DJ Premier for doing that. I've been watching like, you put me on it, but his little like, you know, the, the kind of like salute. The vlog the video. Ticks, oh, the yeah. List, amazing. Great. Amazing. That, those yeah, little I mean, videos are great. Primo's obviously one of the greatest of all time um and yeah his beats i mean you know nine 99.9 of the time his beats are just amazing every now and then there's one that slides by like oh this is okay but like even his his like not greatest beats are still it's still up there yeah totally uh, yeah always been a fan of dj premier yeah definitely primo is incredible yeah man yeah so okay so i um so yeah did the gordon bennett records thing right and that was one of, that was a, that was a favorite kind of time for me of doing that. That was kind of during uh, kind of uh, that was that was a, that was a, actually quite a long period of time. But anyway, 
Um, I ended up kind of going, we, get, we ended up going our separate ways. Max did, uh, went into kind of video production, like d- did a lot of stuff for films as well, like, which is pretty cool. He's, he's kind of popped up in a few um, credits in the, in films that we've seen since. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, he, you know, he's working within a team and like that kind sure, of stuff, sure. but it's still very, very cool stuff. And I obviously went my kind of different direction. Now, I ended up working at Toys R Us after doing this, um, you know, going back as a mature student, to study creative music production. So I went and did that. Uh, but before I did that, I was in New York and I was working at a place called Bigfoot Music in Manhattan at wow. Union Square. I got this. So this was this is me and my hustle, basically, because I was I basically I was I was living in the UK at the time and I had all these music. I had all these kind of I, I put these like so basically I, I created these packs and they had these like sleeves and I put like a letter kind of cover letter in that explained mm-hmm. what this particular thing was and then a CD and a mini disc because mini disc was big at the time as well uh, r- remarkably. So these were like an EPK like an electronic or like a press kit before the internet. Basically yes yeah. it was like all of my beats on the CD that were you know related to this and there's some explanation about all the beats and all the track listings and everything another one with like maybe a, a mixtape on it another one with a different track uh, like pr- project i'd done so it's basically like my portfolio but like these packs were huge and then like i bought these plastic kind of like folders like see-through folder real fancy kind of things cost me a fortune i probably put together maybe 30 of them right cost me a fortune in like discs and all sorts and paper and printing And I sent them out in jiffy bags to all of the places I could find in in New York, basically studios, music production places, all that stuff. Sent them loads out because I I ended up working as a camp counselor for a number of years at, at Camp Luema in New Jersey. And through that, I met this guy who was into marketing a really nice guy called Matthew Geller. And he gave me this like list of all the people that he worked with in music, like, because, you know, advertising and the music they, they need for it. So I ended up getting this like master list of everyone in the industry in New York, pretty much. So I sent everybody, as many people as I could, these packs. I probably sent out 30, cost me a fortune in shipping. I ended up probably getting responses from 10, which wasn't a bad return. Most Great. of the responses were, we don't really have an internship or anything like that per se. And finally, there was one of them, one of them out of the 10. Some of them were a little bit like, not too sure, but this is really cool, really, you know, really impressed. And they responded because they thought it deserved respect to respond to it, I guess, which was nice. But this one company, Bigfoot Music said, yeah, this is really cool. We have an internship program. Why don't you, you know, contact us and we'll see what we can sort out. And I'm like really excited. I'm like, okay, this could be really, <coughs> excuse me, this could be really big. So I'm like thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I was actually going out to New York with friends for like a little kind of break over kind of like New Year, Christmas kind of time after that period. And um, we, so we flew out there and I said, I'm going to be in New York. Can I just come in and chat to you face to face? And they were like, you're going to be in New York. How the, okay, do it. So I went in, spoke to them, got on really well. Everyone was really nice. And the building was unreal so i go into this like you know you go into the this build it's all like kind of skyscraper type building at the, bo- the bottom floor obviously and it's like um yeah i'm here for bigfoot music and the guy kind of like tells tells you where to go to what elevator you go up or whatever and it was right up to the top 21st floor right um get to the 21st floor they had a corner like a whole corner of this building um looking out on union square and it was absolutely beautiful. And you could see like all of New York. It was, it was um, unreal. So I get there, speak to them, really impressed. The whole place was gorgeous. They had a kitchen and a little lounge area. They had all these like loads of studios, just like, it was like an L shape basically, but they had like studio, 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 studio. And all the producers had their own individual stu- studios. It was, it was mind blowing. Anyway, I met loads of cool people there and, uh, it ended up being like just really happy, like went really well. They were really up for me doing it. I gave them all my information. Uh, they took some like stuff down for like, you know, possible visa stuff. I get home and then that's when the problem started. And it was things like, oh, unfortunately, even though, you know, we can, we want to do this and we really want you to be uh, on the internship program, we have to go through this visa process and it's taken ages. And the visa process took so long that it, 
overlapped where their internship was going to be done. They mm-hmm. needed to get someone in. Uh, but... So I ended up kind of having to like say, okay, well, I'll do it for free. I'll fly out and I'll just do it for free. Um, you know, just observer. And I'll do all of the work that the internship was was going to be done, but I'll do it like totally for free off the books, just as an observer, as a, as a, you know, it like kind of like learning on the job type thing. And they were like, well, okay, if you want to do that. And I'm like, I really do. This is too big an opportunity. I don't want it to, to slip away. And I ended up going out there for like three months and doing like this amazing, like, like living with like friends in Belmore, Long Island, um, my mate Russ and his parents, they put me up in their um, under their amazing basement like flat. It was like they had their house and then their basement was this like bedroom, TV, gym, all sorts of stuff. I was like, this is crazy oh, wow. cool. So I stayed with them on the weekends. And then during the week, I would travel into uh, Manhattan and I'd stay with friends in Manhattan so I could get to work every day. Right. And it was the one of the most incredible experiences ever. Like that's wake, the best. Yeah. Waking up in New York on like the coldest day on record once as well. And I just walked like the 20 minutes to the to the thing. It wasn't that cold. Um I'm from I'm the UK. I can deal with it. I can deal with that. What year was this around? This was uh 2004. Okay. 2004. Toys R Us was still in Times Square. Yep. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I, mate, I hit Toys R Us up so many times. Yeah. Uh, but that was, uh, when that one closed, it was a sad day. It was, it really was. I'm glad they're kind of coming back, but is you know, it coming back? Oh yeah. They're going to be 400 Toys R Us stores in Macy's locations to start with, but there is a flagship store opening at American dream in New Jersey, which is going to be this ridiculous. It's going to be like, you know, uh, Toys R Us Manhattan, but it's going to have a slide and uh like a what was it an, a cafe and ice cream bar and i was kind of going that does not mix well does it with kids <laughs> there's going to be a lot of vomit there's going to be a lot of vomit um well yeah. i'm just happy that the kids are going to get to have something like that totally that's good so and anyway, the big kids too so yeah please yeah, new us. york that's incredible 2004 so, mate, hanging out incredible. long long island on the weekend incredible. manhattan in the week incredible so i did that that whole experience So, what type of work was it it was like okay so i would get in there and it was like okay so we've got a group coming in we're doing like a we're doing a commercial recording for schwab or whatever it was at the time they had like a, they had a they had all these big kind of clients really big ones um but it was like it was very it was it wasn't it wasn't like a big company they but they were just so cool but they had these big clients and they had like sports stars that were there to have to do like interviews with and then uh, not interviews but like you know recordings with and then put the commercials together and stuff they did like a lot of commercial stuff and it was just incredible but anyway they'd be like yeah so we, we need to set up the studio for it can chris can you run the cables can you plug everything in can you set everything up for a recording app so frigging lootly yeah so be like, perfect we need to set the drum kit up done needs to plug all the, the and it was it was like well um you know uh chris is getting not chris sorry um uh, Mark is going to be doing the um, recording in his studio. So make sure you run the cables to his studio in the main recording studio on, you know, so I was patching things in, I was doing all this kind of stuff and it was amazing. Like I didn't really know at first I was, I was really like out of my depth, but after a couple, I, I would stay long nights and I would like um, learn on the job with this guy called Stephen DePaolo, who was like the most talented guy I've ever met. And he was, he's one of the reasons for my like, I don't know, kind of like my work ethic now. Cause like I was, I would work hard, but going through college, I was more interested in basketball. I wanted to play basketball every day, but like, you know, I wouldn't really put the work in for the, that stuff. But once I met him, I was like, oh, this is what you need to do to be successful. You need to just be working all the time, but in like, like a proper way and also a way that like you enjoy. So like seeing him and he was really just like, the engineer but he could play every instrument he could pick anything up and play it he was the mixer and master of the entire company he was the guy that did all of the the groundwork but then all of the cool stuff at the same time like this guy was like he was like a hero to me so i tried to spend as much time with him as possible and during my time there i picked up so much eventually like i'd be going in like every i'd be going in we'd be staying there nights and recording so like i I said to steven like would you better engineer me for like a couple of like just a couple of recording sessions he's like 
absolutely because he loved hip-hop music and he loved what I was doing so it was like I'd write some verses during the day and then that night he'd get in the like we, I'd get in the booth and just spit fire and he would engineer it for me and I ended up with these gorgeous tracks like there was one called ill which is one of my favorite tracks i've ever done as the light starts to fade in the darkness cascades over streets roads parks avenues and lanes that's when i come alive and my mind starts to gain when my pen hits the pad where the ink makes the waves where the songs all escape from my day lock brain where the scribbles of unreadable text all become plain i see things clear now it has all become sane the scribbles are no longer riddles it has all been explained i'll send it to you it's one of, it's up there it's on my um Diagnostic 80 SoundCloud, I think. Ill. Um, and um, oh, there's, an, there's another absolute banger as well. It's getting a little bit difficult trying to be original, tasting the talented runoff and the creative residual. Take the sun away for the nocturnal criminal. Keep the sight blindfolded to the simple and the minimal. Hard staying metaphorical at the same time lyrical. If you use too many words and your brain gets cynical, it's hard enough just being an honest individual with a constant conveyor belt of the same old miserable. I always forget them because it's been so long. But like two absolute bangers came out of that. More than that, but like those were the two that I put up on SoundCloud. And again, I'll send them your way so you can check them out. But they're just, you know, oh, they just. And you're making them in New York. Exactly. I'm in a a studio with windows looking out at this gorgeous view and like doing these amazing, amazing things. It was an amazing time. Like, trust me. Um, And like, you know, we, and after that, we'd maybe get pizza in or we'd have, okay, this, this crazy story. One of the people there, Jenny, really cool she was like um I'm, I'm not sure if she was in a, I think she was more kind of like in the admin side of things but we got chatting away and everything and she said yeah we used to spend time with our family in Norfolk so we were like I'm like what so they traveled over to Norfolk she knew some of the places I talked about and I was like oh my god I can't believe this so we like we're chatting away anyway I come away from from talking to Jenny and like just being like I can't believe she like went on holiday to bloody Norfolk near where I live like this is incredible and uh, you know, mind blown. And, uh, and my, my mate said to my guy that I was working with, Owen, who was also from the UK but had dual pa- passports, the lucky git. So he was a British guy. So we got on really well. And he he said, "Do you know Jenny's brother is is Toe for Grace?" And I was like, "What? The guy from that '70s show, friggin' Venom in like you know Eddie Brock in like Spider Man Three, and when Tobey Maguire was in it, you know, uh, in Predators as the as the serial killer guy at the end. Oh, yeah, Predators. <laughs> yeah, he he's in a ton of stuff. Like, and yeah. and I was like, and I'm like, no, mainly for that '70s show though, in it yeah. basically. But I was like, I was I was like, that's interesting. That's cool. One night, no, one day, I had to go in on a Saturday and help another artist who worked there as, as you know worked at Bigfoot doing like some engineering for her so this was the kind of it was this was the I was happy to just go in every friggin day so I'm like yeah a hundred percent went in on this Saturday spe- especially and we're working away at stuff just the two of us in this building doing the engineering doing the and and she was like right can you just um can you just like fix this track for me like you know levels and that kind of stuff yeah sure, no, no worries so I'm doing that anyway I hear the door the door opens and I'm like that's weird we're not expecting anyone we should be the only people here I get up, walk around the corner, bang into Toe for Grace. And I'm like, oh, oh, hi, how are you doing? Like I knew him, you know what I mean? Jenny's there as well. And we, and I'm just like, oh, hi guys. Trying to play it really cool. Like, I, you know, because Jenny got a little bit annoyed, I think if you ever mentioned it, or if you like tried to talk to her about the fact that she was, you know, Topher's sister. And I was just like, you know, trying, I couldn't, I can't be cool. This is, this is a very big celebrity in my mind. So I'm just like all over the place. And in the end, we, you know, they, they stayed in for a little while. We were chatting away and we started talking about, oh yeah, us and Jenny and I would go out to Norfolk when we were kids. And, and I was just like, I can't believe I'm having a conversation with Topher Grace about how he would go on a holiday to Norfolk in England with his family this is absolutely bonkers so yeah really weird really weird day and then I ended up going to lunch with him that day as well which is another you know interesting uh, I, by the way I wasn't tagging along and being a being a 
that kind of guy they did invite me um so i you know it wasn't that bad and i did i did it one point. i did <laughs> i did go at the end like just before like lunch I, like just after lunch i was like i better go but it's been really nice because i didn't want to like overstay my welcome I felt i'm sure really... you were a perfect gentleman well we'll see about that when the uh when <laughs> Topher grace's autobiography comes out and he mentions <laughs> god that douchebag from uh from bigfoot music no but that yeah and so... he still collected toys i know <laughs> I've probably got an action figure of him actually because of Spider-Man. But yeah, like so I yeah, so that was an amazing period of time and it was broken up over cuz I would like finish there, fly home, rekindle my you know, try and work uh, in a way that would get me money for a short period of time and then kind of go back and do it again. So I did these little kind of stints with them. I think overall I did like probably about 6 months worth of of work with them and I just loved every second of it. Um yeah, they were they were great, had a great time. And then while I was there, I was kind of like, I really wanted a job there, but it was really difficult with the visa process because you had to, at that time, it was like you had to offer something that an American couldn't do. That was like the, that was like the party line for immigration. It was like, you know, if they're calling out for doctors and you're a doctor, then great. If you're calling out for this, but it was it wasn't, you know, if you can just do something, if you want to just come and do something out here, it's got to be something special, special. Yeah. So yeah, I needed sure. the qualifications, which I didn't have. I didn't have specialist qualifications. So I I spent a day with Owen just looking at what I could do to do to fix that. And he found this company in Norwich near where I lived called Access to Music. He said, do you know about this? I'm like, never heard of it. And ended up kind of applying for them. Took this experience from New Bloody York with me. Got mm-hmm. in there no problem. Like, like, and this is the thing like you do like, a, like you do like three years usually. And I went straight mm-hmm. in at the top year. So I was like, that's great. I'll do it for a year. I'll get the same qualification. Bob's your uncle. I finished there and ended up working at Toys R Us. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, uh, didn't isn't quite... that how? Yeah. But then, I mean, but but then what? A year at Toys R Us. Uh, I was there for Rise of Cobra, so I got to pick and choose all the toys and leave them in the back and get them later. Yeah. So, and we got them weeks in advance. So I was like looking through, like, um, do you know if this if it had been like if it had been like internet heavy back then you know uh facebook and all the groups and all that kind of stuff it have been really into it then i'd have been like the like oh look at all this this guy getting all of the scoops on all of the toys coming out because i don't think i don't really think that was happening it wasn't then. no it wasn't and i mean we've talked before but i was working at a comic shop right in that and uh in that era and same thing like i remember there were one or two comic book podcasts or action figure forms and things and the last thing I wanted to do when I got off work after being around comics and toys all day, I didn't want to go on the internet and hear other people talking about yeah, it because yeah, totally. I lived it and heard it all day and heard everyone's opinions. And so, so I remember for the longest time, I was very like not interested in hearing about any comic podcasts or comic to, you know, toys or anything because literally I was living it and all day. And like when I would, be there on the floor watching guys go through 20 different spawn figures to find the perfectly oh, painted yeah. it's like oh this guy's got it let me just look at all of them and then you'd have to take out all the statues those were the worst the statue I'm, anyways it's that's a whole other story but but yes had you been uh you know online and, and active then sure that would have been a thing been and now i look back like, oh, it's check, like listen out. yeah yeah like i wish at the time i'd had that you know I didn't even have a phone with a camera or anything no, at that point, no, my, right? No, and it's like, yeah. Weak back then. <laughs> my phone game was not on point. No. Uh, but yeah, totally. It would but, have been a whole other thing to to do with them. But the people who did pioneer it back then, you you know, you got to see what they did with that stuff. But yeah. Uh, well, so while, yeah. I was, while I was at Access to Music for that year, I impressed them so much they wanted me to come back and teach. So I'm like, cool that's a little side hustle maybe in the future like i was i wasn't really thinking much of it did the toys r us i actually got the toys r us gig while i was at access to you know fund my way through it because uh you know i was um i needed to work while i was uh, a student well every artist needs a side job and when exactly. you get one that you like that's the best right that's what exactly I with the comic shop and yeah for sure for sure so I was doing that while I was at Access as a, as a student. And then um, when I got to the end of kind of uh, Toys R Us, I was getting to that point where I was getting really anxious because I was like, I've got this like creative music production 
qualification. I'm not really doing anything with it. I want to be making music. I want to be doing, I want to go back to, I was, I was wanted to go back to New York, basically. I wanted to live, oh, that's where I wanted to be. But the Bigfoot thing just wasn't working out because of the visa issue. So I was like, okay, well, let's put that out of my mind and let's move on to the, what can I do next? And then following that, um, I was just like, really, I was really anxious one day about working at Toys R Us any longer. And I was kind of, I need to end this soon. And my, um, uh, a teacher from Access came in, Rob Lockwood, with his kids, because they were coming into Toys R Us. And he was like, oh, hey, Chris, how you doing? And I'd seen him a couple of times in Toys R Us with his kids. So it wasn't like, you know, oh, fancy seeing you here. Um, and we got chatting away and he said, like, are you, you know, are you still into, into, you know, would you be into like teaching, do you think? Because I think there's a, there's a thing, I think there's a job opening uh, this year. And I was like, mm, I'm kind of interested in that. Uh, and he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll get Chris in the office to, to let you know. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then like the next day I got this Facebook message from Chris saying, hey, there's a job. Do you want to come in for an interview? And I'm like, do you know what? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Went in there. And I said to, and, and this guy, Ian Johnson, who was the, the, the guy that was running the show at the time, lovely guy, amazing. One of the most eccentric, brilliant people I've ever met in my life. I love him. Like I will always, he's just one of those, he, like he kind of, he set me on the right path, shall we say. And he's this kind of like, he's this really, this guy that knows everybody. He's been in the industry loads of, for years. Get this. He was Ed Sheeran's manager. Ed Sheeran, right? He got him like, Basically, he got him the manager who then took him all the way. Like he basically was like, he, he basically helped Ed so much that Ed does talks, access to music because Ian did so much for him. So I've met Ed on a number of times because he's come to the, the college to do a talk and I've had to like be there to, you know, like help him out or set him up or whatever. And he's the nicest kid. Like, well, wow. sorry. He's he was the that guy, guy on Game of Thrones, right? He was on a... <laughs> yeah that yeah he did a little thing i think yeah that's the only thing he's known for really yeah no, he was at the campfire I'm, yeah yeah i mean he's like, got talent he i mean i remember him he blew up while i was at access music he was on the jamie fox radio show or something doing his thing and jamie fox blew him up in the u.s and like that was it then he was like everyone knew who he was so yeah like uh but but ian johnson anyway he was interviewing me so i'm kind wow. of a bit intimidated because this guy is like he's so very Grace, ed sheeran I know like, this is a lot of name drops at the moment, isn't there? You're, no, you're going to be in a lot of biographies. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, yeah. So Ian Johnson, amazing guy. Uh, and he dressed like, you know, like flat cap, very kind of Victorian gentleman, like very like, I don't know, something you'd see in like uh, Sweeney Todd or what was that? Um, what was that show recently with like Tom Hardy and um, all those guys? It's all like very old school Victorian London um anyway anyway like kind of that like style very eccentric but a lovely guy an amazing dude i don't and know peaky blinders, peaky I'm now blinders. Very, thank peaky you blind, yeah thank you that's what i was thinking of so you know he, he very much like that kind of style but very mm. like well-dressed dapper dude like proper proper cool as hell um and he's but he's also very like I don't know, almost like a bit cockney and a bit like quick and a bit like all about, yeah, let's do this and do that and do that. Very nice kind of guy, 100 mile an hour all the time. So I get into this interview, sit down with him and he's like, um, yeah, so he's telling me all about the job, but I haven't said anything yet. And he's literally basically, it's almost like he's trying to sell me it. And I'm like, dude, I'll, this is amazing. Yeah, it sounds great. The only problem is I'm, this is what I'm earning at the moment. And I kind of needs to be like at least the same as that. And he's like, oh no, you'd be on like double that. And I'm like, okay then amazing uh, so I'm, I'm surprised I'm, you said the only problem is i can't get you know the new snake eyes figure when it comes out <laughs> <laughs> thankfully that was the last we ever saw gi joe at retail i think pretty much um but yeah so uh yeah it was it, it was a, a really weird experience i then leave thinking oh that went really well knowing i hadn't said anything the entire interview like it was almost very much ian had just been like yes yeah, so we'll do this yeah go, brilliant right so come in and this time and i'm like have i got the job like, I didn't even know if I got it or not. So That's I go, amazing. I'm, I'm like calling my dad. I'm like, yeah, it was really good. But I don't, I think I got the job and it's going to be this amount of money. The most I've been on in my life at that point. Um, Cause it, you know, it was like an actual proper career for a start. And, uh, and I was like, okay, this is cool. So I end up um, like messaging Chris and saying, I did I get the job? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah. Um, come in this, this time, this day, whatever. And we'll get you sorted out this thing. And I'm like, right then so i start next week okay cool 
went in, did it. I was there for six years. And by the end of it, I went from like, like I think key skills I was doing, but then with like things like I was also teaching composition um, and a couple of other bits and pieces like digital. Basically I was the, I ended up before my end of my first year, I was the digital musician uh, course manager. So I was looking after all of the, the, the kind of producers and there was an engineer course and there was a performance course and they all kind of like intermingled with each other in certain positions, in certain times and certain sessions. And it was just really cool. It was like one of the coolest things, highly stressful because you go in, you know, and it's one of those things where they, they like Uber recruit in the first couple of weeks. So the first couple of days of my, my time there, I'm in a room with more students than there are chairs and computers. So it's like, what the, what do I do? I don't, you know, I'm, this is like new to me. I'm in at the deep end. I'm having to like public speak in a sense. And it was just, it was a bit of a mess initially. When I left, we had gone into, we'd moved buildings. Uh, we got into this incredible, uh, it was like a TV, it was an old TV studio. They used to film a show called Trisha there and a show called Nightmare. And Nightmare was this kid's show. It was like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Uh, on TV, you can look it up now. It's amazing. One kid has a helmet on and can't see anything. And he's walk. he is being like um, directed by the other two guys in his team off, not in the same room. He's just in this random room, CGI. So it's like 80 CGI, proper, proper rubbish. And <laughs> they're telling him like, you've got to walk out to the front and then there's a table and you've got to pick this potion up and then you put that in your bag and and then a, this oh no there's a there's a there's a head coming out of the wall and you've got to throw this at it and and then you know that kind of stuff and you know they had to like direct him on the on the floor pieces as the floor was falling away proper dark stuff but really fun they filmed it at this at this building so it was it was just this gorgeous like renovated tv studio with a venue upstairs a huge venue upstairs so the performing artists could literally practice in proper conditions. We had uh, multiple like live recording rooms, big, again, like probably bigger than this apartment that I'm in at the moment that would just have like a drum kit and a, and a setup, you know, mics and, and guitars and all that kind of stuff. And they could do like little performances in their sessions to, you know, to other people in their group. Uh, engineers could do their, the sound engineering. Uh, DJs could do stuff you know it was it was amazing and then we had classrooms with th hundreds of computers like Max that's where I learned logic basically I learned logic on on you know as a, a student there and then kind of continued that into uh, teaching it in um, access and I was there for six years I ended up leaving um, and I was I was the I got to like second in command should we say like so you had the uh, the com who would like run the the, the center and then you'd have the um, the kind of guys below them who would do like uh, the curriculum managers, effectively curriculum leaders. And it was myself and, and my mate Dan who were the curriculum leaders. Dan did the performance, and I did the digital. So I did all the produce producers and sound engineers. Dan did all the performance guys. And then we kind of like we re we we basically built this like incredible. You know, we went from like one of the one of the worst centers to easily the best by far in the six years I was there. And, and I, I felt like I had, you know, I put a lot of work in. It was it was like 24 hours a day. You know, some people are saying yeah. like teaching just, you know, in those periods. No, we're talking like having to set things up for the summer, redo curriculum, like constant work. It was nonstop. And in that time, still managed to crank out some tunes. Uh, worked yeah. with like Duke Slammer on some on the What For, which is one of my favorite tracks I've done with um, with him. Did a track with Wolf, another a really cool uh, good colleague friend of mine, Alex Jones. Um, he did tons of, of tracks, like a really amazing producer, musician. Again, um, we did a track called Voices, which again there's a video for it, there's a music video for it. I'm not in it. It's just a, it's just my obviously I'm rapping, but the it's like a mouth that moves, animated with loads of crazy stuff happening. <laughs> Totally sick, dude. I'm totally sick through. Think of this as an unofficial ill part too. With 4L3X banging hard on the effects, completely disturbing the position of perfectly good presets. Very cool. And um, that's on Spotify and, and stuff like that. You can kind of get, get all those on there. And yeah, and I also did an album with Dan, who was my curriculum leader in, in you know, in together. Uh, but we that was like um, almost like an, um, oh, what's the word? Can't think of the, the genre. 
we called uh, we called ourselves heavy petting and it was like um yeah it's amazing and it's like el- electronic hip hoppy um but he's he's a singer he's like a proper like you know indie kind of lead singer in a in a band and an amazing musician as well hey hey come around again and let's tell Under electric lights, we'll find our way. Yeah, it's it's just brilliant. You'll have to listen to it. It's heavy petting. It's on Bandcamp, and it's it's freaking awesome. Nope. And you're rap you're rapping on that while he's no, singing. I, I'm, no, I'm just it. making it. Just produced. produced made, it. Nice. Made, like so, uh, Dan and I got together. It was called. Cool. It was for an album in a month, by the way. So we did the album start to finish in the month of may i want to say of that year that we did it and it was for like a special thing that the the music scene would put on in norwich every Mm -hmm. now and again it's like this little facebook group but then you know they would they would kind of like gig it and all that kind of stuff and dan and i was like we're like we we should do this for this month um because we had nothing else to do at work bloody hell like the stress we were under i don't know how we managed it i remember we we i went around his house for one day and we carved out like a bunch of like ideas he played he was playing the piano i recorded that and then i kind of made you know added the magic like with the beat and the all the kind of other aspects to it and then it, it, honestly that the some of the tracks in there i love them they're so much fun but i'm singing on it i sing on it with him like we do like some um like harmonizing and we do like there's, a, there's an element where i'm kind of like call and response so i'm like singing on it as well But for the most part, it was all the production and the mixing and, and all that kind of stuff on my end. But that's that's one that I really enjoy. And his vocals mainly are just incredible. That's uh, amazing. So yeah. Yeah. And really. that all took you to podcasting and getting you up to sort was, of where close to where we are now, right? Like, yeah, pretty much. And that was that's kind of been where we've really kind of connected over that, really. And I think um, you know, sending you tracks as soon as I make them now. It's like, mate, here you go, have these. Dude, well, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for as things open up, hopefully more in 2022 and beyond and uh, more travel. Have you ever been to Canada at all? No, we have not. And like, yeah, we, we need to do it. We need to do it. See, I've been to the UK and, you know, I was I avoiding bad. you when I was there. But... I know. I didn't, I didn't get the memo on that one. I will I will say, though, like, it's funny because I, I, I have traveled a lot. I've covered a lot of the globe. Canada just and not because I don't want to. I absolutely would love to go. We've got friend. We've got you out there. We've got um, my friend Afan Detox, uh, who I mentioned earlier in the in the show. Um, so we want to see him and, and his his uh, partner Jem. They they're getting married actually. So shout out to Jem and Afan. Um, but yeah, like so yeah, uh, we've got loads of, loads of friends in, in Canada. I can't wait to to actually come and see you guys as well. Like, You've uh, always got friends in Canada. Everybody's got friends. We've, the world has friends in Canada. That's our uh, that's on our uh, our nicest license place. place. <laughs> nicest place on earth. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, you know it's not perfect, but we like it. So, uh... <laughs> I think uh, I'm just thinking right now. Have I covered it? I think I've covered everything. We've been on it for like two hours. I think I've definitely covered. Oh, it. this is fantastic i'm enjoying it and it's it's great to uh to hear something other than cobra commander suspender updates <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding i love so look we, i do want to talk about that really quick because with full force yeah and you know obviously your love of gi joe and all of your skill at, at sound engineering and development and, and, and musical background like it all comes together and yeah. you you work on you help other people's podcasts i know you've helped me out you've helped a lot of people so are you currently like producing a bunch of other podcasts are you doing a lot of stuff in sort of the audio so my uh, side of things like my yeah. job my, my job uh has kind of evolved into this this kind of like almost like content creation thing now but um i do a lot of i'm like okay so i'm, I'm effectively um you know by trade a freelance content creator or videographer producer 
it's just easier to say creator in it sometimes but videography is the one that's kind of been paying the bills recently and that's mainly with you know again my toy connections with boss white studio uh and kind of like kate working for them as well um I, i'll do a lot of kind of their video work so um you know a, a lot of like filming them uh doing interviews with them uh laying music over it making it look cool video editing kind of grew out of the podcast stuff actually because it was something i always wanted to do uh, i did a few little bits and pieces here and there and then really started enjoying it and then yeah all of a sudden found this like little niche that I've been kind of like doing recently. So making music and visual stuff for Boss Fight Studio has been like the main part of that. I do a lot of Kickstarter videos for people. Like I've done obviously one for Skeletron, um, for Rage and Spoon's complex, uh, you know, base building system. Um, like a lot of those kind of like, you know, the kind of indie, you know, video stuff uh, for, for a lot of people. And, and that's been really, you know, I've found that really like fun. And that's another kind of way to kind of, do this kind of like thing that I love and at the same time actually get paid for it and feel like, oh, wow, the, the stuff I do is actually worth doing, you know, and, and I, I really like that feeling. Uh, so a lot of my talents have just been have been kind of narrowed into this kind of uh, all encompassing like tape to reel moniker, uh, which is where like, you know, the professional aspect comes from with, like I said, Boss Fight Studio uh, videography for multiple people. I do I also do videos for a guy called uh, Steve Shreve, who is a health and fitness guy. And I've been doing a lot of his kind of marketing videos and making them look really cool and sexy. And a lot of his actual workout stuff, because he has an app. So you can kind of like download his app and do workouts based on your, you know, uh, your situation, whether you're, um, you know, we just want to do some like in house stuff, just like basic stuff, or if you've got a gym that you can use and, and stuff like that. So that's been kind of fun as well. And again, you know, lots of these little, I suppose, lucrative kind of, they're not even side hustles. They're the main hustle for me. You know, that's what, that's what makes the money. And then the podcast, yes, it's a hobby, but it's actually, <laughs> strangely enough, in the last couple of years, it's become an actual profession, uh, believe it or not. It's actually, you know, bringing in money now uh through patreon and through um you know youtube that, that that has blown me away and like getting like a steady income stream from youtube and we're not even like we're not even like big numbers you know what i mean like we're at kind of like very modest numbers in youtube like three thousand subs uh we get like you know regularly get like 1500 1200 1500 kind of views on, on videos but it creates this like nice little steady flow of money. So it's actually become like a really cool, and thank you, by the way, for everyone who supports the show. Um, you know, again, a lot of work goes into it. I create a lot of stuff, lots of videos, news bursts, like as and when, like you say, whenever there's a belt buckle or, a, you know, the, the old belt suspenders, um, you know, that the, they, they come, they, they I drop them, you know, as and when. Uh, the recent kind of a uh, couple of days, you know, a few days ago, the whole HasLab thing, we did a live stream like on the cuff, off the cuff. We did, you know, I do a lot of stuff for Skeletron, the indie company that, you know, that, that did the Robo Skull Mark II. So there's, I mean, like put it this way, fingers in a lot of pies is the, is the, is the thing with a freelancer. Because if you're not doing a lot of yeah. things, you're not going to really be successful at it. And I'm, thankfully I found like a nice, comfortable you know, um, way of, of kind of making money and, but also doing things I really, really love. And you can do it from the comfort of your own home or, you know, where you go. And it, it, you know, I've seen like how things have grown for you and, you know, just doing interviews with, yeah, you mentioned like <laughs> yeah. the HasLab people, but the, doing the snake eyes interviews, that was incredible. Oh and, God, and getting was, yeah, access dude. to all that. Like you were part of the circuit. I you know, the, the, the press junket. Yeah. How nerve wracking that was <laughs> when I got a message from my rep at Paramount, who are, they're great. I love my rep at Paramount. I'm not, I can't say names, but she's amazing. And she was contacting me, like saying, um, yeah, okay. So I couldn't, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't get you the, the hour that you needed with with Henry, but <laughs> I've got you all of these lined up for the the press junket with all of the the actors, and then Henry can do like half an hour. I'm like, are you serious? Yes, to all of that, please and thank you very much. And so yeah, like I managed to get two interviews with Henry Golding, and talking to him was a delight because he he was really nice the first time, obviously, and then the second time it's not even like, you know, like I kind of felt like there's going to be a bit of like do you remember me we did a thing a couple 
no he was like chris how you doing it's been um so because we were kind of contacting each other on twitter as well like talking back and forth Mm -hmm. so like i was just in this surreal like how am i talking to henry golding how had his belt buckle you know (laughs) (laughs) but that that yeah that was that was a that was a career highlight yes a hundred percent but also haruka abe a amazing lovely person again another person who's very like very lovely on online and like constantly messaging and saying like really nice things so love her because she's great um ursula cabero wow just like lovely again they're all so nice and andrew koji who like i don't think you'd mind me saying this but i was very intimidated by andrew koji because he's just got this presence about him mm-hmm. like there's something about him that's like very you know just demands respect he's amazing in warrior he was yeah, amazing was say, a warrior is just oh, yeah great just yeah. absolute yeah gem of a human being mm-hmm. right really cool dude a super like effort like just yeah just gives off this like really cool vibe loveliest guy so nice and chatting with him he was so like i don't know just really really cool and really open and i thankfully i got them early like i was on the press junket first i think and um because i was just you know I was, I was i was obviously doing the right things they were they were you know making a lot of waves for me which was great um and i really appreciate it but like I got in early with them and I got them first thing. So it was like, you know, I was happy about that. And then also I can't not mention Stephen Alaric as well, who plays Snake Eyes' father in the film, did an interview with him for ages. Like that was another really nice one. Like, you know, again, really nice guy, uh, you know, really happy to kind of do the interview. And like, it just, it was one of those ones, you know, when you, you do some interviews and they can be a little bit like, ugh, you know, like you kind of like, you know, they can just be difficult like hard work do you know what I mean and with those guys every one of them I think because they're so professional like it just it's smooth and it's there's no transit there's no like awkward pausing and you know like trying to think of something to say and it was just really great and with Steven just another really top dude so big shout out to all the people that's uh, great well and it's for you also in that situation like with the Snake Eyes movie for example I mean that's Advanced You're passionate. Stick as well. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's it's great to see those interviews because if they got interviewed by Entertainment Tonight, I wouldn't care. But yeah. when I see you interviewing them, it's like, okay, great. So you, this is the market. Like they want to talk. You are the people, the reason there is a film about Snake Eyes is because yeah. the fans have kept this character alive for so long. You can say just me. And, you can say it's just and, down to me. That's no, but I, I do think it's great that, <laughs> you know, Paramount and has labs and, and these, and you know, they are talking to you and taking that time yeah. to, to speak to people because you've got a direct line into really the heart of the community. And I know there's a, a lot of other great podcasts out there and, and, and other venues for these people to, to speak with, but, you know, throughout all the ups and downs of, you know, specifically GI Joe fandom, because that's where, you know, we know each other from, and that's clearly where, you know, our, histories you know are are are, we're very very deep and involved so it's nice to see when bigger events happen within that world of gi joe that these they're come the people are coming to people who who care and who are are interested in it and you know oftentimes over the years you have seen them not do that yeah and uh oh definitely and and it happens with everything and and all types of fandom and again those are those are conversations that can just go go off right but i mean absolutely you know that's no i know what you mean like there's, there's definitely that the yeah that kind of thing of like you see like someone who's kind of very passionate about it and yeah, like you say, if you're watching, if you're watching an interview on like Entertainment Tonight or something, it's and they're just- like, "Are you Fast Kick?" <laughs> <laughs> I had Fast Kick as a kid. It's like, no, I want you know, uh, yeah, Quick Kick's not even a ninja. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, I um, I definitely had a blast doing that because also at the other side of it is like i'm really passionate about gi joe but like i know they're really doing it you know it's a job for them at the end of the day you know mm-hmm. like obviously the, yeah. they've taken they've committed into it in a big way but you know they're, they're gonna have like a passing knowledge of it they're not gonna be like what i'm what i'm exactly. into exactly so then you have to kind of approach it a certain way and i think like doing a lot of interviews over the years and kind of like like not in this case because i seem to have just kind of just dominated the talking on this one a lot 
but um you know no, i've like, just been enjoying it it's been great man it's i don't think great. anyone else has but yeah the <laughs> I, I feel like you know when you get when you start to kind of see how to do proper interviews and you kind of do a few you start to realize okay that you know this is how you're supposed to be and you're supposed to be kind of like water and you're supposed to also be like a little bit like you know let them let them speak like you have done with me today amazing <laughs> like you kind of let them tell their story and then once that natural kind of pause is there you come in or you know what I've learned as well is like that kind of nice banter where you kind of keep it bubbly and fluffy and fun and you joke about with them a little bit you find the line early you know and, and you kind of you see what, what how it goes you kind of feel them out a little bit don't you in that sense and um I feel like doing a lot of interviews at the time I've actually got this like I feel like very natural with it now it feels like my natural go-to to just be like in this conversational but still informative and still structured like a balance you know like because the other thing is like I'm very when it comes to like actual the podcast stuff I do I write the whole shows literally so it'll be like the intro is is scripted you know but you know people know that because it's like a hey it's the intro of the show da, 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 and then everything else isn't but like for the most part I script everything and I and I try and pace it in a certain way so that you know like I'll you know I'll ask the the other co-presenters questions and keep things moving um fill it in with a bit of jokes and stuff like that but I want it structured because people that listen to this stuff th yes you can have the, the the chats that go on for for ages like this has done and that's going to be that that is something that I enjoy too but if you're listening to like a regular thing you kind of expect certain things don't you and you expect them in certain places and if you don't have that or if it goes on too much of a tangent, or if it's not really focusing on what you guys are actually there to talk about, that can also be a little bit, you know, you can kind of disappear and not really pay attention to it. So I like to have that kind of balance of structure, you know, and information, but then also a bit of fun and a bit of banter and a bit of jolly, like lightheartedness as well. Yeah, no, and you have done that. And knowing going in and what you said at the start of that as well, the actor who plays any of these roles, they didn't grow up spending their whole life. Oh, one day I hope I get to play Storm Shadow in a movie because I know everything about this character yeah. and I am perfect to play him. Yeah. No, that doesn't happen. So understanding that. And so when you see the fans get upset, oh, this, you know, so and so would never do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's pointless. And yeah. so and understanding that as well and that they are like, listen, we're in this big movie and uh you know and you see it with marvel and some of these people do truly love it and some of them don't right yeah like, yeah uh, and they're like i'm just trying to get into you know maybe the people in snake eyes are like we're just trying to get into a marvel movie <laughs> exactly yeah and and, that, and the other thing as well with that is like i you know I, I when i got the opportunity to do it i just jumped at the chance it was like yeah, yeah of course i'm gonna of course i want to speak to them of course, I want to like chat to them. This is incredible, not just so because I can put it out for content and get some views, but because like, and I don't really, that's the other thing. I haven't really, I haven't really thought about when I do the, the podcast, it was never to build this massive audience because you, you, you're kidding yourself. If you're doing a niche podcast about a niche, niche product, this was like, it was about action force, which was like, you know, a sub genre of a sub genre. And so like, I, you know, it was never about that. And it, it hasn't really been about that since. But what I really have enjoyed recently is that kind of, you know, you put something out there and you're getting like the, like the justification that, yeah, other people are enjoying this. And a lot of other people are enjoying it. And you're kind of like, okay, well, I'll do more. And then it kind of grows like that. And I'm not thinking, oh, yeah, forget like, you know, 10,000 views on this. I'm going to be like, not, I, I couldn't give two thirds of a poop. I'm still going to make that news burst that gets like, you know, 200 views and I'm still going to make that live stream that just gets absolutely inundated with people and comments and questions and all sorts. And I love both of those equally. I just love doing this stuff. I love like, and, and the funny thing is like with the news stuff, I'm trying to be like up to the minute, but it is difficult. Even in GI Joe, which you think is kind of like a very easy thing to kind of keep on top of, it really isn't like the the things popped up recently that I'd never I hadn't seen had been out for two months, and they were like little bag clips, and I'm like I didn't know these existed, and I've got to do a news burst apologizing to people that because I didn't know this was a thing until today. A bag uh, clip. 
a bag clip, little figure figure style GI Joe. And people bag thought clips. I was joking about the suspenders and everything, but no, these are. And it gets listen, worse. I love it, gets it too. Worse, I'll tell you that much <laughs> right now. Hey, look, I love it. I got the Christmas sweater, which uh, oh. I feel like might have tipped you off. You, I don't know if you tipped me off or somebody tipped me off. You tipped me off on the shirt I'm wearing. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, the Defiant, the kind the of G.I. Joe space shuttle what? team thing. Yeah, what? love it. And so I don't know if people listening and don't have the video right now, but if you, you are watching, I'm wearing a, the G.I. Joe Defiant t-shirt, which is a shirt I've waited basically like my Forever. life to get yeah i love the define of the fact how it's on good, a t-shirt how good was that day when hot topic dropped all those man how good and was then that? it was even that day was even better because i tried ordering it they wouldn't ship to canada and then i was like listen i really need this defiant t-shirt and you let me ship it so my clothes got shipped to grit that's why he's on the podcast now because that's why i've got this this let- dope wrapped <laughs> type of t-shirt that only like two people on earth have those are very very rare yes the uh yeah the beautiful beautiful the you can't really t- uh, you, you might be able to just about make out the color but it's this gorgeous like i don't know like a it's maroon, like a violety maroon violet yeah. maroon the violet maroon sounds like a it's, character in some sort of movie doesn't it violet maroon violet it's a, maroon. actually violet maroon does sound like you'd, you'd hear that name in one of those old noir detective movies wouldn't you it's like a sin her city name character. was violet yeah. maroon and she walked into the she walked into the room that kind of thing yeah absolutely yeah it's frank miller would create yes violet, violet big maroon. time big yeah. time i can see that um and the yellow as well well orangey yellow but again the light is a bit bright on this but it is like more of a it's kind of like a, a deep mustard it's very nice yeah we did a few exclusive colors Gorgeous. with that and there's a like a blue and uh i i got one or two for myself and that cap yeah shout out eric miller who designed that and cody peters who designed the shirt they I look am great on you fully yeah. decked out in word it's, burglar stuff it's great well man it's it looks great Thanks, uh, and there's been so much we've covered and i know oh, we, we haven't you know, even we talked about more. us we haven't talked about the music we've made together, have we? Well, we've made some great jams. You know, there's a Toronton. All right. What can I tell you but the Toronton? Running along the dawn with our long jumps. On foot in the snow going for wontons. Vice for Donna then sliding by your onslaught. Toronton never froze and won't quit it. When the going gets tough, you know it goes with it. It low digits. So frigid, no blizzard could ever slow down the town. Snow lizard. Cybertron, sir. Straight out of Icon. I've been striving on Cybertron since before the primes first turned their high beams on. Right along with the pride of Ironhide. I'll be kind, recording everything like rewind. Letter from Snake Eyes Part 4. Finally back in the world to continue my service. Lonzo would assure me that this was my new purpose. With the team of green shirt, highly trained specialist. Kept it to myself, told the others, don't question it, trust me. Return, and there's so many more. Spectral Mike. Yes, feels like I can shoot a lion from my chest. Insides on fire, hawks flying to a nest. Invest, and I'm striving for the best. Utilizing the horizon, my guide to conquest. Eyes are gone west, the minds on what's next. Like tone on your phone defines the context On text, I'm different when you hear me Like if Apple ever fires Siri Natural Mike, of course About and... a guy called Michael, who's uh, a ghost No, I'm kidding, it's amazing Spectral Mike is my favourite track we've ever done together I'm putting it on wax right now um, It's Visionaries based And I, I, don't, I don't think there is one single Visionaries reference in rap music and you did a whole track about it and i'm i'm so happy i did the beat for it and it is an absolute banger if i don't if i do say so myself it's it's fa- yeah i mean that beat is incredible i've always loved the music and uh i've always loved the world of visionaries it's been there you go little beatbox yeah amazing. yeah it uh, you know there's i mean that's one of those things that uh Again, as a kid, Visionaries was on one day and then it was gone and you never saw it again and you never heard anything about it. And then for years and years and years trying to find out any information possible. And, you know, that keeps coming back. You know, every time we talk, these things come up and it's, you know, why do we still love this stuff? Why are we still so into it? You know, all these years later, you know, 
Um, and you know, we will always love it. And, uh, you know, I look forward to telling my kid about it one day and like, she'll be like, what are you talking? You still like this stuff? <laughs> Dad, you're 70, <laughs> you know, um, would still be making tracks, I guess. But so yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm trying to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be a hundred year old rapper. That's the goal. That would be and a great gimmick. Wouldn't it? That's well, this is what I'm going to do. So still got, still got a few more years to get there. So <laughs> a couple more albums to do before I get to a hundred. Toronto uh, was a fun one as well. Like yeah, I, I, that was a great, that, that was brilliant. I remember they're sent, all great. I like oh, it when, yeah. whenever you send me the, you know, the kind of, oh, okay, so I've recorded the vocals. Here's like a, you know, like almost like a little bounce track we've, we've done. Not, it's not fully mixed or mastered. And you, I, I just play it. I'd be like, oh my God. It's just like, it's one thing to make a cool beat. And to like, you know, you, you put like the, the, the you, you know, you, 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 you know, you sequence the drums, you layer the sample, you chop it up and you kind of move it around a little bit and you kind of try and different, like, you know, uh, different structures with it just to kind of get like a nice kind of groove going. And you make that track and you're like, yeah, that's cool. That, I like that. And you kind of, you create what would be a verse, chorus, verse kind of structure. And then I send it off to you and then it comes back and it's like transformed, no pun intended, like Cybertron, sir. And that, like for that, that for example, Cybertron. So when you sent me that, I was just like, uh, for one thing, it is again one of those tracks with more Transformers references in it than than the Transformers show itself. Like <laughs> you managed to put like, and it is just nonstop, and it's nonstop because it's it's like the way you do it. I love how you. And, and again, like the rappers do this in general, especially good ones. But like, you know, it's like the obvious thing, the, the obvious two things are there, the rhymes where it's like, you know, it could be like one character and another character, right? But then there's an overlapping like connection with the two characters in the, in the line. And then there's another reference within that that might get missed. So there's all these like layers to just like one line. And I don't think people really understand the level that it takes to kind of like to come up with that like sometimes it's like very natural and it just and it just happens and you're like oh yeah and then you find that there are other things in there that you weren't really intending to but then there are times when you really try to kind of weave these textures and I think that you do that more better than than most in the industry especially when it comes to nerd stuff like I, I absolutely love it well thank you and you know the best feeling is when people hear it and pick up on it and enjoy it because I'm just having fun with it all. Right. And, uh, and I spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about it and, and yeah, sometimes you're right. It, it, sometimes it just comes out and it's just like, wow, that was just there. And even like Cybertron, sir, most of that stuff was stuff that was just in my head that mm. I was like, these are my favorite characters. Oh, who rhymes you, whose name sound Rewind. the same that could rhyme together. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? And like, wh where does this go? And then if I just like if I lock into a subject and it's from freestyling or just like living all this stuff and like it, you know, it's just you get that hyper focus on the subject. And, you know, like we're what we're doing today, we're talking and you just and that's all it is. And you just focus in on this one thing and then you just go and you yeah. just blah, 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 blah. And I think the original <laughs> Cybertron was probably like three times longer. And I just yeah. like, I got to cut this down because especially on those tracks, like where Cybertron is, sir, that's like a three verse track. And I think the third verse is longer than the first two. Like, I think the third verse is actually like, I think oh, it's mate. 24 bars, like, and they're all, but the beats fast enough and, and the song doesn't seem to drag and you, you have to keep that energy up. And we, you know, there's change ups and there's cool stuff. Yeah. Oh my God. But usually when a song, if I do a song and it's like three verses. Oh my God. It just get every time when I, when I, when I hear your vocal come in on that as well, it's just like the, the, all of the, you know, the, the goose pimples, the goose bumps all like kick off and you're just like, oh yeah. And the hair on the back of your neck stands up. It's like. That is the track right there. It's absolutely superb. Well, and that's a credit to the beats too. And like every beat, like when I, I take a lot of time, like sometimes I'll get amazing beats. You'll send me beats, Beat Mason, Kills, Tim, everybody. Like I get these So beats, many talented like, producers, man. It's insane. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just, I'm spoiled. And, <laughs> but I need to, I always feel I need to do justice to the beat. So when it's a beat I love, I could love, I have beats. There's a beat on the new album that's dropping uh, on Bergonomic. I've had this beat probably 
since like 2008 and I just could never get the right song for it. But I have loved the beat this long that finally it's going to come out on the album because I finally cracked the code. And I was like, yeah. I know, I know what this song it's is. Like I know what this, well, it's like the beat is saying something to you and it has a voice. And yeah. I guess I just take on the voice of that beat. And in a way it is sort of acting and bringing on this, like you're taking on the character, you're taking on the feeling yeah. of what this beat is giving you. And, uh, and, you know, it works both ways. I'll write the song and I need the beat to match that mm. character and that feeling. Right. And you have something like, I think of like the snake eyes tracks and like, oh, yeah, that was these great, are like, right? uh, it's yeah. an emotion that you have to tap into and everything. So, you know, when you work closely, we, we work closely with each other. You work with producers and rappers and stuff anyways. And that's what I love about hip hop and all music in general. But I find with rap, it's like, this is where, when everything is hitting from the beats and the change-ups and the lyrics and the vibe and the performance, anyways, it's, that's, that's the whole thing. So it's, uh, you mentioned Spectral Mike. I mean, that's like, yeah, I'm taking on this character in that song and Cybertronus are the same thing and the Snake Eyes track. So, um, and I love that when it's a character that I care about or, uh, you know, like you're talking about creating a character for your thing, um, you know, that's when you can like tap into that. You are like, I have to do, I, I have to do justice. So thank you for giving me beats that inspire me that way. And, uh, and then right. sometimes you've given me beats where I'm like, I have the perfect song that has been waiting for this beat, like right now. And yeah. it's just, and some songs I can write in a half hour and some take me, when was 2008, you know, 13 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, uh, it's, I'm it's, very excited about what the future holds for uh, for, for both of us. Lots I love of the stuff. process. I've got to say, I love I love throwing a beat your direction and then hearing it, you know, come back a few like weeks later or something and just being like, oh man, because it it really does, you know, when when everything's put together, it's 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 funny, isn't it? How like you feel like something's missing from something and then, but you don't realize it necessarily. You're just like, oh yeah, that beats, that's fire, that's cool, brilliant. But then you hear the vocal on it, and you're like, oh my god, yeah, that's what it needed. And mm -hmm. yeah, and it just, it just, yeah, it completely, um, yeah. And especially with space, but verse having to like work on so many tracks with you on that. Um, and just everyone you sent back to me, I was like, geez, like, wow. well, it just worked so perfectly. Yeah. And there's, Loved oh, it. there's more, there's, there's, we got lots more good stuff. Oh yeah, we have. There. Can't wait. There's uh yeah, there's some in the vault right now, I think, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, slow right. and steady. I think I've literally told you everything ever in my life. <laughs> but you know what's great? You never spoke about any of this stuff on full force. I mean, maybe with you and I on our episodes, we've we've covered some of the same ground, like when you've, again, graciously had me on the show. But this was great. And I just wanted to, you know, talk to Diagnostic 80 and get the background. That's what we do on the weekend. We hang out here. It's so great to to finally get to just chill and and just listen to you and, and hear hear all these great stories and understand more and then i hope our listeners go and check out full force and and hear that and uh it's it's just nice to know because i know who's there you know when you're not reporting on on the latest pair of you know <laughs> snow job boots you know you got to get them dr mindbender's monocle you know mainframes laptop dr. It, no, it, it would be dr mindbender's cod piece definitely <laughs> uh that they would do no man it's been well, an that... absolute pleasure man I, I really appreciate you having me on and i know it's gone on for absolute ages but like i it was it was fun to just chat about all this stuff that i haven't really thought about for a long time and then you start thinking about it and you're like oh my god like you we, you kind of look back at it and you think oh i actually have made quite a lot of stuff like i've made That's a great. lot of things yeah and i'm quite happy about it yeah and so, you're just getting yeah. started right i always hear Pretty you know now, everyone yeah. quotes like stan lee never really started doing stuff till he was 40 right like yeah. he was doing stuff but the marvel universe didn't start till he was 40 i mean there's so many other creators you know we could mention but that one always pops up but it's fun to uh to think about that stuff it is yeah I'm just I'm, I'm hoping i've got a few more years left in me and can uh oh man start cranking out some really successful stuff like i'm really excited for it yeah you already are and you will and there's so much 
uh, good stuff coming. So thank you. I will be tuned into the full force and we will be uh, talking very soon. And uh, listeners, you will be hearing a lot more from diagnostic uh, right. beats and otherwise. <laughs> and, uh, so, yo, this is great. So, yeah. Right along with the pride of Rewind. I am the all spark alpha to Zeta Prime. Diaclone, way ahead of my time. Optimus Primal, transforming with a monkey on my spinal. Stunt it comes, junkie on. <laughs>